Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar in Kanzita's Practitioner Development Series. My name is Dr. Blake Myers, and today I'm going to be giving you a really wonderful overview of GI overgrowth of Candida. And this is something that any of us in a regular busy practice need to be aware of, but we're going to go beyond Candida and really give you tools that you can use to just help with gut health in general and to restore health when there is gut dysfunction. As you will see, as you go through the different webinars in this series for practitioners, we're going to cover multiple aspects of gut health, how it impacts overall health, and how you can support the return to balance and restoration of health because so many of our patients need this kind of support. So many of our patients on a daily basis in a regular busy practice have some level of gut disorder going on and it's often impacting the rest of their body. And sometimes the primary cause of the symptoms that they're coming in, even if it's not in the gut, as you go through these series, you're also going to see that we're giving you a lot of the most current research, and we're also going to give you really amazing time-tested, tried-and-true approaches from traditional naturopathic medicine and how to use those things to support the normal functioning of multiple biological systems. Just a little bit about me. My name is, as I said already, Dr. Blake Myers. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I've been practicing as a naturopathic physician for over 10 years now in the United States. My practice has really encompassed many different, uh, different areas of specialization, I guess you could say. I started out in primary care or uh, like as a general practitioner, but really quickly what I saw in my practice was that I was getting a lot of chronically ill people, people who had been really sick for a long time and they just weren't getting answers. They weren't getting well and they weren't getting answers from the conventional Western medical model. And so it didn't take very long uh, in my start of my practice to start moving into understanding at a deeper level what causes chronic illness, how do I help these people with chronic illness. And, and as that went on, it was things got more and more complex. So kind of worked into even more complex chronic illnesses and how to sort of peel the layers of the onion back, so to speak, and start to help people get well. Uh, some of the main areas that I've worked in within that space has been gut dysfunction of different sorts. Gut dis dysfunction underlies a lot of chronic health issues. So that kind of makes sense that that has been a major focus. I have also done quite a bit with, uh, with mental health, the brain and mental health from an integrative approach. I've done integrative addiction medicine. So for five years, I worked uh, alongside an addiction medicine specialist. We did detoxifications from opiates and benzodiazepines and alcohol. And after people would detox, I would work with them on a longer term basis to help rehabilitate their brain and their bodies from long term from the effects of long term substance use. So I kind of have that background as well. And I'm also uh, an instructor in a master's and PhD program in integrative and functional nutrition. So that gives me kind of another, you know, area of specialty is using nutrition specifically in, uh, in helping to restore, uh, you know, health in the body. I also have a lot of training in many other natural medicine modalities, such as herbal medicine, hydrotherapy, constitutional homeopathy, physical hands-on medicine, lots of different things, biofeedback. So kind of a broad experience training and experience that I have in my practice. I am currently the owner of Chiron Healing Arts, which is an all virtual healing space. I do all the things I just talked about there, work with people from all over the world virtually in that aspect. And I'm also an author. I have uh, a book called The Natural Apothecary, and uh, I've also done a, a, a lot of different writing. Uh, from a medical perspective over the years.
here are the goals and objectives for this webinar. We're going to go over the microbiome basics. A lot of this you'll probably already know, but we're just going to cover some of the basics, give us a little refresher on that. We're going to cover the basics of candida. So the characteristics and qualities of candida uh, as a species and uh, the good and the not so good, you know, those sorts of things uh, in terms of within the body and especially the GI tract. We're going to talk about causes of GI candida overgrowth. And then in your practice, what, what does overgrowth look like? Signs and symptoms that uh, you might see when patients are coming in so that you can kind of recognize this. And then we'll, we'll go over testing briefly, just a, a couple of the ways that you can consider testing for candida to see if you're suspecting that if overgrowth is what's going on. And then really this number six is like the bulk of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to give you a really pretty specific but holistic protocol that you can use right now today with patients as this comes up, as the need for this comes up. And I'll teach you some of the nuances of, about the protocol and how to maybe pick and choose, you know, and make the, make it individual for the person in front of you. And then there'll be some additional considerations from a very naturopathic medicine perspective about uh, how else you can support the function of the gut and the overall health of the person to, to improve and, and really turn their help turn people's lives around. Cause that's what this is all about. Right. A little bit about gut microbial terminology. A lot of times, you know, most of us have heard the term microbiome. Some of us have also heard the term microbiota. I just want to, I just want to clarify a couple of things here. So this quote under microbiota comes from the paper that I have referenced down there underneath of it, but microbiota describes the living organisms found in a defined environment. So all we're talking about, if we're talking about the gut microbiota, we're talking about just the organisms, all of the organisms that live there. A lot of times this gets conflated with microbiome and people will say, will talk about the microbiome and what they're actually talking about. It may be the microbiota because the microbiome microbiome is all of the organisms, but it's also all of the byproducts that they make. It's all of their met secondary metabolites. It includes the environmental conditions. So if you're talking about you know, butyrate as a secondary product, talking about structural elements that maybe, you know, organism uses to hold on to, you know, a cell or mucus lining or something, you know, all of that is the microbiome. So the microbiome is just really everything. And so the, from that, I just want to point out the term mycobiota. You'll see this if you start to look into the research, the mycobiota are all of the fungal, specifically the fungal organisms within a living, within a defined environment. So the gut microbiota is candida and many other species of fungi that, that live there. The microbiome, I don't know that I've actually seen this word used in the literature, but I just thought I would extrapolate it to that. You could imagine if you were talking about in the gut, all of the fungi and the and their byproducts and stuff, you'd be talking about the microbiome. So what are the roles of the gut microbiome in health and homeostasis? This is not an all-inclusive list, but this is some of what I tend to think about right away when I think about the reason that we need a healthy gut microbiome, because one of the first things that it does in our lives is it educates our immune system. It trains our immune system. It helps it to develop appropriately. And then after that, so that happens in infancy, and, and continues to happen throughout childhood and, and, and life in various ways. But it also just regulates our immune system and essentially helps to keep a balance of our immune system. So one of the things you'll see when there's a gut you know, dysbiosis, for example, there's an imbalance in the microbiome in different ways, the immune system gets dysregulated as well because it's a foundational part and the majority of our immune system is found in our gut. So that's a really important, probably the number one consideration. It also protects us from pathogens, from infection, because 
if you think about all of the organisms in the gut, they're taking up real estate, right? And different pathogenic organisms that might come through uh, our mouth and then through the GI tract, they have to be able to kind of get a hold and get their own real estate, right? And if you have a really healthy population of a number of organisms, they will they will fight off letting other organisms in. They make byproducts and things that are antimicrobial and that, you know, they have their ways of holding their real estate, so to speak, and fighting other things off. So it's a really important thing. And we'll come back to that when we talk about the reasons for candida overgrowth in the GI tract, because this is essentially what we see uh, with candida overgrowth is, uh, you know, is that they're, kind of has been some real estate given up in a sense, and then the candida can take over it. The gut-brain axis, I could have listed any axis here because the gut is connected to every single part of the body. There's the gut-liver axis, the gut-heart axis, the gut-kidney, gut-thyroid. I just listed this one because I, I just tend to think of it first as the most important because it's so intimately connected, the brain and the gut, the, and, you know, our, our brain and, what's going on in our brain and even within our thoughts, et cetera, impacts our gut health, but also the reverse. And so the, depending on what the ecosystem in the gut looks like, it can impact our mood. It can impact our behavior. Okay. Uh, It's really interesting when you start to read the research about how much the gut milieu can impact our brain and things like our mood and behavior starts to make you wonder who's actually in charge and running the show. It's pretty, pretty incredible. So I think of the gut brain axis right away as well. When I think of the reasons for a healthy microbiome, gut barrier function is another huge one. So the microbes themselves, and then the byproducts such as butyrate from healthy uh, gut bacteria, this is essential for keeping uh, a, a solid barrier in the epithelial cells of the gut, but also, you know, healthy mucus uh, layer, for example. And then we also need to remember all of the different secondary metabolites that microbes make. They can make hormones and neurotransmitters and vitamins and short chain fatty acids and so many other things. So just from that, all those things are, can be made and go into our bloodstream and impact our health for better or worse, depending on the situation. And just to remember that alterations in the microbiome can contribute to disease in virtually every body system. And there's so many chronic diseases that now we see that there's a connection to the gut. Let's talk about candida as a commensal organism, as a normal part of the microbiota of the gut. So the research is relatively new, actually, in terms of understanding candida species in a healthy gut environment. We're, We're starting to learn more now, but, you know, 2015, 2016 is where you start to see people looking into this more. It's relatively new. One of the main things that people are thinking is that it's probably helping to train the immune system, which makes sense. That's what we, we have a really solid understanding of the bacteria in our gut doing this. The candida is probably doing that too, but also protection against pathogens and some specific ones. So there's, there's pretty solid research to show candida when it's at healthy levels in the gut as a commensal organism that it protects against the overgrowth of, of Clostridium difficile and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it's important to, to remember that, you know, in 48 to 80% of humans, uh, Candida albicans is, is a normal part of their GI flora. So thinking about it, not in terms of, that it's a bad thing, I think is really important right off the bat, realizing how common this is and that in healthy levels, it's actually probably providing a really important role, especially when you see that uh, it's much easier to get colonized with something like C. diff uh, when candida uh, levels get altered. But if they're 
if the levels are there, it will help to fight that back. So candida and a healthy gut, really this just is another way to reiterate what I was just trying to say. It's like a plant in a forest. If you if you look at a forest, there's multiple, multiple different species of plants, right? Of trees, undergrowth plants, etc. And they all really have their place. They all really have their niche. And there's no reason that anyone is bad and anyone's good, right? They all kind of do their role and they all do some of the same roles of like maybe fighting off, uh, you know, invaders, pathogens and things in a forest and they help one another out. There's symbiosis. So candida is just like one of those trees in the forest. And what is important to remember with this topic, as we get into talking about the problems with candida and overgrowth is that it's not, it's not inherently a bad thing. What we want to do is restore eubiosis, okay, which is kind of the opposite of dysbiosis. So if there's an imbalance, we want to restore balance. Eradication is not the goal. And, and that's, that's something that I'm going to come back to and really try to reiterate because that's the very Western medical model of thinking about organisms is like, oh, this is causing a problem. It's bad. We need to get rid of it. We need to eradicate it. And that's really not what we're going to be talking about here because that's, that's not the goal. Uh, arguably should not be the goal at all. Candida is pathogen. So candida species are what are known as pathobionts and pathobionts are just, they're potentially pathological. So all that means is that Sometimes they're not an issue and sometimes they are. So when are they a pathogen? I put quotes there because uh, it's still the same thing that was not an issue before, right? But it is now. So why is it? Well, one could just be too much of a good thing. So overgrowth could be a really big problem. If it just takes up too much space, it starts to cause issues with the balance and ecosystem, essentially. And so that's called opportunistic overgrowth. It gets an opportunity and it takes it and then it can be a problem and it can be difficult to deal with. There's also the aspect of morphology. So there's kind of a, an invasive morphology that we'll talk about in a minute. And then there's maybe what you might call like a quieter morphology of candida. So it could also just depend on the ones that are there. Are they kind of transitioning into a more invasive or troublesome kind of kind of way of existing. When is candida a problem? It's not a problem until it's a problem. And this might sound goofy, but uh, this is, this is true for so many things. And it's like uh, something not in the gut would be herpes simplex virus. The majority of people in the world, I think it's fair to say, have a herpes simplex virus or HPV, uh, human papillomavirus. But these things for most people are dormant they're, or latent, right? They're there, but they're, they're not an issue until what happens. Uh, maybe the immune system gets suppressed for a reason and then it pops out and someone gets, you know, a herpes outbreak, you know, cold sores on their mouth or something. It wasn't a problem just because it was there, right? It's a problem. It's a problem once it's a problem. So uh, essentially this means, you know, to me when there are symptoms and there's dysfunction, if I were to see a test and it said that there were excess candida, but the person didn't have any complaints, I took a whole history and there was nothing wrong in their review of systems or anything else. I wouldn't treat them even though the test showed that, right? Granted, I probably wouldn't have a test result unless there was a reason to do that, but you probably see what I'm saying. And just to touch on the morphology aspect again, there are, there are two main types of uh, ways that yeast will exist. Candida. There's the yeast form and it's like these in this picture, little balls, and then they can just divide and like little ball splits off into two balls, splits off into four. And it's thought that this is less of an issue that it's, 
there there is some you know research to show that they can create an issue in this form as well. But in general, it's kind of thought that in the yeast form, they're just kind of hanging out, you know, using energy and and resources around, but they're not they're not necessarily causing a problem. This other form is the hyphal form, and so this is when they they shoot out this projection called hyphae. And this is what's known to be the invasive form. And they need these hyphae. They have to have these hyphae to invade cells and to form biofilms. So this is really important to understand because if you can do things to maybe get them to go switch back to the yeast form or to prevent the yeast form from going to the hyphal form, it would be beneficial most likely for the person. Biofilms is a big issue. I'll touch on that again in a minute. But uh, the the hyphal form is required for that. But there is another morphology. It's called the gut. And it's funny because it's an acronym and the words for the acronym don't match it. I don't know why this is, but gastrointestinally induced transition. They'll call them the gut morphology. And this happens when the yeast actually, most of the time the candida will be living in the small intestine. That's where all the, they can get access to their preferred food source, glucose there, right? Because it comes out of the stomach and then they have quick access to it. But what's interesting is if they pass through the small intestine and go into the colon, into the large intestine, their morphology will completely change and they will change their entire metabolism, their cell wall structures, so that they can exist in this space. And this is the thing about candida that's really interesting is it's so flexible metabolically, structurally, it can it can survive practically anywhere that it wants to in the body. It, it's quite well, uh, it, it's it's adaptable to any environment within the human body, basically, that it would want to go. It, especially if it, uh, it changes into like an invasive morphology and gets that kind of window in. Biofilms are an important thing to understand when you're treating really any chronic infectious issue. Definitely an issue with candida in the gut. A biofilm is is basically a protective barrier that organisms make around themselves. Bacteria will do this. Yeast will do this. So I'm trying to think of an example here. So a, a, a common example might be, um, well, if you haven't brushed your teeth in a day, like if you forget to brush your teeth and you kind of like feel on your teeth, it feels a little bit, I don't know, grungy. Like you can feel the texture is different. That's a biofilm that's formed on your teeth from the normal oral flora. Biofilms form all over, you know, in the body from organisms, but this is an issue, a really big issue in hospital settings with instruments and things that, that organisms will form biofilms on an instrument or something. And the thing with biofilms is they're really strong a lot of times and they're protective against antimicrobial agents. So if you start looking into research on biofilms, that's a lot of it you'll see is, uh, trying to figure out ways to clean instruments in a surgical setting or something that breaks through a biofilm and kills the stuff because what will happen is regular cleaning agents will clean everything off the outside, but it won't penetrate the biofilm. And these organisms just live inside the biofilms just fine. They'll just hang out until they get the chance to come out and, and take over, you know, the area. So that's one of the areas that you'll see it, but it's the same thing in the body and they will hide from, from your antimicrobial treatments in the gut. They will hide out in the biofilms. They'll hang out with other organisms in the biofilms. That's why I say biofilms and best friends. They will hang out in the biofilm with other organisms that they can be symbiotic with, that they, that they do well living together with. And they'll all just hang out there together until the opportunity is ripe to pop out and start start dividing again and reproducing. They can hide from testing in these things too. So I'll mention that again later, but biofilms is really important to understand. So having something in your treatment protocol that breaks down biofilms can be really important and often is really important to remember. And I already mentioned that they're really metabolically flexible. This is just a couple of papers to show this. 
So this top one, what I wanted to point out with this is that most of us think of yeast and, you know, candida craving sugar. That's true. Glucose and, and breaking it down through glycolysis, it's their favored source of energy and carbon usage. But as you see here, they will morph if they need to, if they don't have glucose, they will use other carboxylic acids. They will use amino acids. They'll use peptides. They'll use fatty acids. <laughs> so you're already like, if you're thinking about, um, the diet strategy, this is interesting to start thinking about, right? That they can just change around, use what they need. And the, the gut cells is this bottom paper that I just wanted to point out again, it mentions how they change to use the fatty acids and N-acetylglucosamine, uh, but that's a, that's a paper that's, you know, interesting that talks about, talks about that transition as they move into the, the colon. So important question back to what's our goal here. And I say it's eubiosis, not eradication. Are they going away? No, they're not going to go away. I think it's, it's very unreasonable to consider trying to totally eradicate some of uh, someone of candida. Why? Well, they can m change where they live and they can hide out until, you know, they could hide out for years until uh, through IV antibiotic therapies, if that's what you were going to do, or, you know, antifungal therapies. And they're, they're just, they're too adapted uh, to this system. So, and they're actually not a problem, right? When they're within a balance, when they're within a balanced ecosystem. So again, I just want to drive home that that is not our goal when we're, when we're talking about treatment. These are the main causes of candida overgrowth. It doesn't necessarily have to be any one thing. M many times it's not any one thing. It's a combination of things together. And that's just true to true with chronic illness in general. It's important to remember that it's not usually one thing. It would be great if it was because then that's really easy usually, right? To just address the one thing. This is usually a combination of these things. And so we kind of need to correct all of these things that, that seem imbalanced in, in the patients in front of us. But medications are a really big one. Antibiotics and oral contraceptives are very well known causes of candida overgrowth. The antibiotic, antibiotics makes a lot of sense when you think about that in a balanced ecosystem, you can think of any ecosystem, honestly, but you know, in the gut, the balance of all of the organisms together is kind of what maintains the balance. And if you remove certain species, especially species that are really important uh, in that in that ecosystem, what you'll see is it gives an opportunity for other things to just replicate more, right? There's more food available now. There's more real estate available. Something's going to take over that available space. Uh, you might be lucky and it's just another bacteria that's really beneficial or something. But, you know, what happens with antibiotics is the person oftentimes was already primed for a candida overgrowth because of things like diet and lifestyle. And then what happens is an antibiotic therapy comes in for a sinusitis or something, you know, it could be anything. And it kills off a lot of the beneficial gut bacteria. And now it's just free range for the candida to take all of the glucose and other nutrients coming in and to start and to grow really rapidly. And then you've got an, uh, an overgrowth problem because once they're overgrown, they're not going to easily want to give up that niche that they're holding. Right. So they're just, they, they, they'll tend to hang on and oral contraceptives are another well-known medication because estrogen will feed candida overgrowth. So think about the Western medical model and how often these are used oftentimes with abandon antibiotics are getting better. Thankfully in the last 10, 15 years, I would say it seems like it's getting better because of our understanding of the microbiome and, uh, and the impacts that, that can have. So there does seem to be a little bit more judiciousness on medical practitioners with antibiotics, but they are not to be taken lightly because of these impacts. 
And uh, oral contraceptives also get used so widely, right? And they get used, oral contraceptives get used for reasons not of contraception. And I think that that's where an issue comes in. I'm not against oral contraceptive use for the purpose of contraception, but when they're getting used for dysmenorrhea and dysregulated menstrual cycles, well, that's not that the, no one's looking at the cause in that situation. Right? So that situation, which really, it, it's really a disservice to our young, our young women who are getting put on oral contraceptives when they're like 14 years old or 15 years old, because their menstrual cycles are dysregulated when really what needs to be had is people need to be talking to them about their diet, talking to them about uh, xenobiotics and estrogenic compounds in our environment and stuff, right? Doing simple things to help regulate their, their hormonal cycle. So that, those are really big things to consider because they're so common uh, in the cause. But I don't think you're really as likely to have an issue with those things if the diet and the lifestyle aspect is okay from the beginning. It's when we see that superimposed on this that we really get a problem. So the Western diet in the United States, and, and you can't make this stuff up, the, uh, this is an acronym in the, li in the medical literature for the standard American diet is SAD. <laughs> and and uh, basically, we're looking at a highly processed diet, lots of processed foods, things in packages, things that have been refined or stripped of different ingredients and put together and used in different ways, right? Processed in many different ways, especially ultra processed foods, really a problem. The diet, the, the standard American diet, and just in Western countries in general, tends to be higher in simple carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are an inherent issue, but simple carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, the types of breads that we have, like in in the typical grocery store, those things are problems. And then nutrient deficiencies. This is both because of the way that we're eating, but it's also because our soils are depleted. So you can find plenty of research on magnesium being depleted in soils and, and is then, therefore it's low in our food. And so there are also many other layers to why there's nutrient deficiencies. Just even our healthy whole foods are more nutrient deficient in different things than they used to be. So those are some of the main reasons that a Western diet is going to predispose to candida issues because these things cause dysbiosis. This sort of diet causes a dysbiosis in the bacteria in the gut already, maybe causing a dysbiosis already with increased candida numbers. And you can get overgrowth of candida just from eating a diet like this if other things come into play, especially like that impact your immune system, like heavy stress, for example chronic stress, chronic alcohol use. So the, the, the diet really is such a foundational component of keeping a robust, healthy gut ecosystem. It really can't be overstated and we'll go into this more, but I just want to point out that that's primarily where we need to look at for what are the underlying, what's the underlying milieu that's really making us susceptible to this possibly causing it on its own without medications. But then when we, you know, do have an infection that is maybe we need an antibiotic for or something, right. Um, that we don't have these problems. Lifestyle to chronic stress is a chronic immune suppressor. Uh, insomnia, sleep deprivation, chronic immune stressor, and it's inflammatory alcohol. Inflammatory does basically impacts every body system and it's a great food for candida. So just thinking about how we live our lives and how we might be setting ourselves up for this just based on the lifestyle and the food that we're eating. Always consider immune function with a healthy intact immune system. It's much less likely that the candida overgrowth is going to be a problem, but all of these things I mentioned, if you think about them, they impact the immune system, nutrient deficiencies, dysbiotic gut bacteria impact immune regulation. I want you to understand what a GI candida overgrowth might look like in your practice. I put looks in quotations and marks because it, 
it's possible that it's not going to look like anything. It might be in the symptoms that they're telling you most likely will be in the signs and symptoms that they're exp- or the symptoms that they're telling you. There may be some signs in the body, but in the digestive tract, I'm expecting that you're going to see something, right? It could be anywhere along the digestive system. Uh, common ones are gas and bloating, especially after meals or like a high carbohydrate meal, but also just IBS symptoms in general. It's possible with IBS symptoms of constipation, diarrhea, either one or alternating. Uh, I would expect maybe more towards the diarrhea with candida, but it can be all over and pain, you know, abdominal cramping, pain, gas bloating, like the kind of the IBS picture, it's possible that it's candida overgrowth. You can also get heartburn and reflux and nausea. So it could be upper, you know, it could be the top half of the GI tract or the lower half of the GI tract. Uh, Also, depending on how far it's gone, how invasive it is, there might be thrush in the mouth. That's kind of nice if you, you see that and like, oh, that's Candida, that's going on in the mouth. It's probably going on in the gut too, especially if there's gut issues, right? It could be burning and sore tongue. There may be, there may be recurrent uh, vaginal yeast infections. I forgot to put that on this list, but you know, if you see yeast in other parts of the body, it could be related to the fact that there's yeast overgrowth in the gut too. Fatigue is a huge one. Fatigue and brain fog and headaches, you know, there's tons of reasons that that could be going on. There's lots of reasons for a lot of these things to be going on, right? So we don't see this and just say, oh, that's candida overgrowth and treat. I, ideally, that's really not what we do. We would like to see the evidence that there's candida there because we don't want to make assumptions about this because, you know, you could make an assumption. It could be the wrong assumption and you treat someone for three to six months and they're not any better. And then, you know, you try to make your next assumption or then you decide to do the testing and see what's really going on. And, you know, now the person's been sick for even longer than they needed to be maybe. So I really think it's important to point out that uh, there are things that we can, we can presume that there's dysbiosis generally going on in a variety of, you know, gut problems. And there's general things we can do that I think are totally fine to do to help support, return to eubiosis. But if we're going to really be putting in a protocols we're going to talk about today to treat candida overgrowth, let's, let's not do that presumptively, I think is an important thing. Unless we're seeing evidence of yeast in some way, like in thrush or something, but fatigue and brain fog and headaches, really common puritis or, you know, itching is very common. Might just be itching in the skin all over the place for no reason. There's no rash there that you can see. There can be skin rashes. Again, that's not on here. This isn't an exhaustive list. It's just some of the main things I might, I kind of think about joint pain might be there. On your physical exam, this is what I was saying, what candida looks like. There possibly will be nothing. It might just be in the history and the symptoms that the person's telling you. There might be a white coating in the mouth and they could have a redness on their tongue, you know, white coating on the tongue or the tongue can be red and it could be like a burning or a sore sensation that also can happen for many reasons, including certain nutrient deficiencies. So if somebody's, that's just a side note, but if somebody's saying I have a burning tongue, painful tongue, think about B12, for example, a common nutrient deficiency. It doesn't have to be candida. They may have a tender abdomen on, on abdominal exam. You may notice gas or bloating may or may not. But a lot of times if somebody's got IBS kinds of symptoms, then there will be a visceral hypersensitivity and there will be some general tenderness, not, not like the sorts of sign where, you know, there's, there's peritonitis or something like that. Not that extreme, but just, there's just going to be a general tenderness. Whereas, you know, somebody who doesn't have those issues, it's not going to hurt at all to push on their abdomen. And you could see signs of yeast on the skin, possibly, which I kind of mentioned with the vaginal yeast infections in the mouth, but could see skin, signs of yeast on the skin, other ways, uh, uh, tinea issues on the skin, could have just other rashes because rashes are common when you have intestinal intestinal permeability and other immune dysregulation from 
gut dysbiotic issues. Maybe there's nail, nail infections, you know, that sorts of thing. Why do people get the symptoms? Well, the main things to think about are that there are endotoxins made. So along with candida, if there's candida overgrowth, you don't probably just have a candida overgrowth. You've got a candida overgrowth with dysbiosis of all of the other bacteria in there. It's just, a, it's a, it's kind of, I think of it like a general dysbiosis picture, but with a predominance of candida overgrowth, but all of the other bacteria that are important are probably out of balance as well. And, and there might be other, you know, other pathobionts. Remember that's a potentially pathogenic organism. And there might be other bacteria that are commensal organisms, but because of the dysregulation in the ecosystem in the gut, those potentially pathogenic bacteria now got an opportunity to grow. And so maybe you have not only candida overgrowth, but you have high numbers of these potential pathogens. You have low numbers of really important things of important bacteria. So this can, this can create a milieu of endotoxins, things that make you feel really crummy, things that they make just as byproducts, maybe things that they make like ammonia to try to keep their environment at a certain pH and different things. You can get general gut dysfunction then because of all the things I just said. So general gut dysfunction can just mean immune dysregulation. You can have gut barrier function, a dysfunction. So that's intestinal permeability and stuff gets through that's not supposed to. And then you get even more immune activation because see, your immune system seeing all these things. So, uh, and along with intestinal permeability comes some level of leaky blood brain barrier. Okay. So this is really important to remember too. Like why is there brain fog and, um, and headaches and things? Well, there's, probably more stuff getting into the brain that's not supposed to as well. Nutrient deficiencies, you know, I mentioned nutrient deficiencies can be a reason, uh, can be some of the background for why maybe there's immune, a lower immune function, for example, and, you know, candida can overgrow, but candida uh, overgrowth itself will contribute to nutrient deficiencies by utilization of the nutrients or impacting absorption, those sorts of things. If you see this picture, if your alarm bells are kind of going off and you think that candida might be going on, there are a few things, a few ways that you can test this. Now, stool culture, I put that on here, but there's really no reason to be doing stool culture now because of the, the level of testing capability that we have, unless you don't have some of this advanced capability and that's all you could do. You could do stool culture but I'm not going to talk about it because for the most part with access to modern testing, there's no reason to be doing that. Really what we're looking at is stool PCR testing and organic acids testing. So PCR testing is polymerase chain reaction. What it's doing is it's, it's actually, it's a chemical process where DNA is isolated and then it's uh, basically a process to amplify the codes of DNA that are there. So what that means is you can do a stool test and you can see the, the, what DNA is there, what organismal DNA is there. And so we can measure all kinds of different organisms. It's a great way to start looking at the commensal microbiome and other pathogens and things. And it's a good way to look for candida and see how much is there based on how much of the DNA was there. The other test that can be helpful is an organic acids test. And this is looking at organic acids that are in the bloodstream and organic acids come from many different places in the body. If you aren't familiar with an organic acids test, it's a really cool one to learn about. And perhaps we can do a webinar on, one, on the organic acids test in the future. It's really helpful when somebody has been chronically ill and you're just you know, not sure what's going on or you're not getting traction can be really helpful because it helps you to understand mitochondrial function. A lot of organic acids come from the mitochondria. And so you can get an idea for cofactors and new potential like functional nutrient deficiencies in, in the mitochondria. But another place that organic acids come from is 
from organisms in the gut. So you can get a window into dysbiosis based on like what kinds of organic acids are there and what level are they. And the same goes for, for yeast and candida. You can, you can see what kinds of organic acids that they produce are present. So it's another window in, and this is an example of a PCR stool test just of the candida, just to show you what it looks like if you've never seen one. So it's normal, right? So the reference range isn't zero. The reference range is five to the 10 to the third. Below that is considered normal. This is a really high result. This is twofold higher. So it, it is a really high result. Just to give you an example of what it looks like, there are a lot of different species of candida. When I talk about candida, I'm generally talking about all of them, but candida albicans is the most common one. But there are many other candida species, and they're and they're and they're often present commensally in the gut. So they list candida species here as being high in general, but we're seeing that it's not it, out of that. The candida albicans is also one of the species that's very elevated. This is what an organic acids test result might look like. There are different organic acids depending on what where you get the test from. All of these might not be there, it just depends. So yeast and fungal markers is how they're listing this here. And so I, I would say, you know, these aren't all specific to candida. I would say looking at what are the level, if there's any that are high, what are the levels of them? And then how many of them are high? And so it's, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, from this just be like, oh, there's a candida overgrowth issue because these two are high. There's a candida overgrowth issue and we need to treat it. If you look, those numbers there aren't really high and there's only two out of all of these possible ones elevated. So, you know, you have to kind of read this one a little bit differently because it's not necessarily specific to to candida, but it's a helpful window in. And if you run one of these in somebody who's chronically ill and not sure what's going on and you see some of these levels, that helps you with a direction to go potentially, right? And the big question then is when to treat, because I, I just gave you some nuance about the organic acids test, for example, but there's also nuance with a little bit with the, the stool test. The, when to treat is you know, I guess I would say you tested for a reason because the person was presenting with certain symptoms and signs that you thought maybe candida was an issue. What if you get a, a, a stool test back and it shows, it doesn't show elevations in the candida, but what if they're high, you know, what if they're on the normal, but high end of normal, you might still treat, right? You might give it a try and see if we do this for a month, two months, what's happening? Does the, is anything change? Does the person feel well? Same with the organic acids test. You kind of put it together with the clinical picture. Sometimes these things are super obvious. It's like, oh, this really sounds like candida. Do the test. Yep, candida's high. I'm going to treat it. Right? That's nice. But I'm talking about more with the nuance. And so y you also just need to use some of your clinical judgment in this. And really, this is the art and art along with the science of medicine. When you're working with human beings, especially if you're working with chronic health issues, it is an art and a science. And anybody who doesn't agree with that, we can have a conversation. And I, uh, I think I, I think that I can make a pretty good case for why that is, because uh, people are not people are not the same as a textbook or research. Those things are helpful guides, but the art comes in from the humanistic component because human beings are immensely complex. We're not simple things where we can look at one or two aspects and address those one or two aspects alone and get comprehensive results. Most of the time, that's not how it is. Most of the time it's an art of balancing you know, how fast or slow do we make treatment? When do I treat? I'm not sure if this is quite what's going on. I think based on what they're telling me and these test results, this is, a, this is a possibility, but not everything's definitive, right? So there's the art of this as well. And, and that's just comes with 
years of practice. As that's why they call it the practice of medicine. So that is the background and we're going to start getting into the fun stuff. We're going to get into the, the treatment protocol and what you can do to start to help people who are dealing with this. Our goal with treatment is health restoration. I just want to drive that home. That, that really needs to be the focal point, the, the inherent nature of humans is to be in a state of health. I mean, this is in general with living organisms, things tend to move towards a direction of health when they're the obstacles to that health are out of the way. Life wants to be move in a direction of vitality until it starts to go the other way and life's life starts to end as well. Right. There's a curve to it, but in general, we're looking at the body is working to be in a state of health. So how do we restore health when there's been a number of factors in place that have brought us out of a state of health? So I just want to bring that to the forefront as that is our goal in terms of how I view it for our treatment. The main things with candida overgrowth, we want to bring a balance in the microbiome and the mic and the, and the microbiota, right? And the, ec the ecosystem, as I like to talk about it, we need to rebalance that and we need to help the intestinal barrier because when the intestinal barrier starts to get permeable, there starts to be dysfunction in the barrier, we see a compounding of the problems. We will see, a, that's where we'll really start to see immune activation and immune dysregulation and uh, you'll start to see a lot of food intolerances, food sensitivities, lots of things start to happen and it can start to snowball. So we need to, we need to heal the intestinal barrier. And then we want to calm inflammation and increase antioxidant capacity. There's most likely a lot of inflammatory cytokines going on with a, a dysbiosis of the level that you're going to see symptoms in a person coming into your clinic. So I, I think it's helpful to calm the inflammation down because not necessarily suppressing it, but cooling the fire a little bit because the person's going to feel better. And it's possible that, that, that inflammatory milieu, even though inflammation is supposed to be the healing process, it might be in a particular cycle where it's, it's, it's not helpful right, right now. And it's actually perpetuating the issue and antioxidant capacity is really important because, you know, inflammation and oxidative stress go hand in hand. One of the things that can happen with a chronic oxidative stress in the body, such as candida overgrowth and intestinal permeability and, and dysbiosis and inflammation is that your reserves to make your endogenous antioxidants goes down. So glutathione is a, is a good example. You can deplete your glutathione status because you've just overused. You're just using so much of it that you're overusing the nutrient cofactors required for that whole, you know, glutathione recycling process to happen. You don't have enough, you're not getting enough building blocks maybe uh, in, into the body for making glutathione, right? You, you might be taking, you might be taking in enough vitamin C and vitamin E dietarily, but it, maybe it's not enough to keep up with the level of antioxidant need, right? So those are just a couple of examples. We really need to make sure the antioxidant capacity is supported, both exogenous and endogenous. And then we want to help balance the immune system and build immune resilience in this, in this goal of health restoration. So notice what I didn't say. I didn't say anywhere in here, we need to go kill candida. And the reason is because again, that our focus needs to be so much more holistic than that. All of these other things I've talked about are going on. Are we going to kill candida? You bet we are, <laughs> but that I don't want to highlight that because that is just one as you will see, one of many different levels of the treatment protocol that I'm going to share with you. Uh, so killing is just one part. And so we don't need to focus on that so much 
because that's kind of a given, I think. Oh, it's overgrown. Let's let's kill it back some. Let's let's decrease these numbers. That part is fairly obvious. It's some of these other things that actually help with he- health restoration that I want to focus on. This is the three-phase clinical protocol that we have provided by Canzita. And the first thing that we do in this protocol is remove excess candida numbers. As I was saying a minute ago, that's probably the most obvious thing that you would want to do. And it's extremely important. And it's extremely important to do that in a way that's relatively holistic since these organisms are so flexible in their morphology and their food sources and they can hide in biofilms, et cetera. So you need a really intelligent approach to removing the excess numbers. It's not necessarily as simple as just taking an antifungal medication, for example, with a, with a wise, with a wisely formulated supplement, you can do this much more effectively, most likely. The second thing that we're going to do with this protocol is we're going to balance inflammation and oxidative stress. This is foundational. Anybody with candida overgrowth, but chronic illness in general, you need to be focusing on this as a baseline because these things often just get dysregulated. The third thing is also extremely important with candida overgrowth and also any chronic illness. People don't always think of this, but supporting elimination systems is huge. It's so important. By elimination systems, I'm talking about the detoxification systems of the body. What is that? Well, largely it's the liver, right? The liver is doing the bulk of the detoxification work in our bodies, but also that stuff has to get out of the body. So this is supporting supporting the detoxification systems of the body and the elimination systems of the body. That's really important. And if you don't know what's going on with somebody, just as a side note here, if you don't know what's going on with somebody, but they're having uh, chronic symptoms, they have chronic illness, if if their elimination systems are not functioning optimally and you help them with this, they will start to feel better. You can do number two and three here uh, as just general support and people will feel better because those things are usually not functioning at their optimal. So that's just another side note that you can use in your practice in general. The fourth thing, functional digestive support. We're going to give functional digestive support and help the digestive system just start to return to the way that it would function if, if everything else was going on, you know, normally and health and healthfully in the digestive tract. Restoring eubiosis, huge. We're not just going to kill candida back. We're going to restore eubiosis. The intestinal barrier, hugely important, has to be addressed. This protocol will address that. Talk about some different ways to go about that. Number seven, replenishing nutrient status. Remember, you can get into this issue of candida overgrowth and dysbiosis because of nutrient deficiencies of various sorts. That can be a contributor, but once it's there, it will also contribute to nutrient deficiencies. So it's really important to just replenish nutrient status, both with diet, but with also with how we're going to talk about in this protocol. Number eight, stimulating normal motility. Now you could put this under number four of functional digestive support because normal motility is uh, just a function of the digestive tract, right? But I separated it out because it's just so important uh, on its own. And this protocol will help address normal motility as well. So if there's any of you that have been doing this for a while and you're wondering, well, why isn't adrenal support on there? Like if somebody's going through this, they probably like, they're most likely going to need adrenal support. You are absolutely right. The thing is a lot of everything else that I mentioned here is supportive to the adrenal glands. So there are, there are other things that aren't in this protocol that you can do for the adrenal glands, but largely if you do this here, you're going to be supporting the adrenal glands and you're going to be, uh, supporting the reasons that there was adrenal HPA axis dysfunction in the first place. So I just want to throw that out there that I didn't forget about that. It's just that, you know, most of the time this will take care of it. And if it doesn't, then you can give some additional adrenal support in whatever, in whatever way that you like.
I'm going to throw in this case example here from my practice before we've even gone over the protocol, because really it highlights, I think the protocol, as you will see, is straightforward. And what I actually wanted to give a case example of was something to illustrate a few of the other things that we've already talked about to bring together how this can look and things that can happen in, in real life and practice. So this is a 65 year old female with multiple symptoms. And I had actually been working with this person for years, pretty sick when she came to see me, mostly severe IBS and digestive dysfunction and GERD uh, initially when we started working together. And over time, some different things started coming up and happening, but essentially you know, this is what the person, the primary symptoms that the person's experiencing. Okay. This is after years of working together, believe it or not, things have gotten better, but some of these things were still coming up. Sometimes they'd get better for a while. Sometimes it'd get worse. Difficult case. But what I wanted to point out here is that you can see, uh, so skin itching was not a symptom for a very long time for this person. And IBS, I say severe IBS, that actually got way better um, over a couple of years. This The IBS got much better. Um, so this is a ways into this case. But what started happening was migraines were getting worse. There was skin itching that was happening. GERD had been a really difficult issue to resolve for a long time. And nausea... And an autonomic dysfunction had just been there kind of from the beginning. That's autonomic dysfunction is difficult. So that was just an ongoing thing. And so the IBS stuff largely was getting better. The migraines and, and the GERD was getting better, but it would flare up sometimes. So the migraines, nausea, skin itching, like those are like big things that kind of came up that, um, we, you know, we looked into early on, we did, we looked into stool testing and I will just say that over a few years, there was multiple stool testings done of different sorts and candida never came up. So that was done. It wasn't like I was working with this person for three years and not looking in. I mean, we, we looked into, this is one of the more difficult cases of my career. I'll just say, so we, we, cr we tried multiple different, um, approaches for diagnostic approaches to figure out what was going on. We, turned over as many stones as possible. And the candida was never positive. So it was not actually really on my radar because there had been tons of testing. What did always come up was dysbiosis. And that improved over time. It was a little bit resistant to a lot of the typical things that I would do, but it did improve over time. And over time, like the, there was more healthy bacteria. There was more of a balance you know, the short chain fatty acids started to be, uh, levels started to be good. The, the secretory IGA started to be good and those were all low. So there was a lot of improvements on the labs, improvements in the symptoms, but then, you know, with this migraines and the skin itching, and then what started to happen is she actually started to get a sore tongue and pain on her tongue. And and then that, so that started to make me think, well, I've got that and I've got the skin itching. It's like, well, this sort of sounds like candida. And so tested again and candida didn't come up as positive. What was interesting was that uh, we did an organic acids test and the, the arabinitol came up elevated, quite elevated and serotonin was quite elevated. Serotonin is, prime, is mostly made in the gut in the body. 95% is made in the gut. So sometimes you'll see that elevated with different things. And it doesn't, that doesn't mean for sure that there's candida, but these things sounded like candida. It didn't show up in the stool, which was interesting, but the, uh, there were the symptoms and then there was the organic acids elevated. And I actually ran this other test that I hadn't mentioned to you yet here called, uh, candida immune complex. And that came back positive. So there were some like immune complexes that are anti candida in her blood. And so we treated and there was a really quick improvement in the, the itching, the mouth, 
Um, the migraines improve and there's just, that's been a bit back and forth uh, because there's more things going on in Candida, okay, in this case. But the reason I want to bring this up is mainly because it it just, I think, hopefully highlights for you the 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 difficulty and the chronic nature of some people's health and that there can be different things that pop up along the way. And candida may have been an issue from the beginning, but it apparently wasn't based on different types of testing and things. But what happened was over time, a lot of things improved, a few new things showed up and then boom, candida seemed like it was an issue, still didn't pop up on testing. Well, why didn't it come out in the PCR stool test? Probably because of biofilms. These, uh, these things can hang out and hide from testing in the biofilms. That's the best, you know, it's a guess because I can't know that for sure, but that is my best clinical educated guess. And so we treated a, a sort of a test to see and and a lot of these things improved. So um, that's an example of a nuance of how do you know when to treat? Well, I just decided to treat because I had a, the skin itching was sort of odd. There was no rash or anything. And, uh, and then there was the sore mouth and, uh, and, and otherwise it's like, actually the digestive symptoms she had were a lot better except for the frequent, you know, episodes of GERD flaring up or of reflux flaring up and then getting better for a while back and forth. But yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't straightforward. So I wanted to just use this case as an example of things can be complicated. It could not be an issue. And then, you know, a couple of years later, it could be an issue when you're working with somebody. Uh, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It's just the nature of chronic illness. So this is not the typical, somebody comes in, Sounds like a, sounds like a duck, <laughs> looks like a duck. Oh, it's a duck, <laughs> you know, treat it sort of thing. So I just wanted to use this as an interesting example of uh, how things can not be so straightforward in practice. This is a really important question to cover. There's a FAQ section at the end of this webinar and I didn't want to save it for that because I think it's very important to talk about this here. Many people want to want to address candida overgrowth with diet alone. They and, and there are many there's many different philosophies about this, I guess you could say out there. But what I want to say, so this is both this is ex, this is experience, this is knowledge, this is my clinical thinking about this. So and also remembering I'm a graduate instructor of integrative and functional nutrition. And I'm saying this, okay. It is very difficult. Candida are really metabolically resilient, right? They can move to different places in the body and they can just shift their metabolism. You're not going to starve them out. You can, you know, stop, stop eating sugar. Great. Really important. Take their primary food source away of, of a bunch of, putting a bunch of glucose into the system. But if they really feel starved, they're just going to switch and start eating, you know, peptides and amino acids and fatty acids that they'll just do that. They'll just move around. And then if you completely, if you completely tried to, you know, starve them out, they probably would just start using your own proteins from your own protein breakdown and stuff. Like it, it's just really difficult. I'm not saying impossible, but it depends on the situation. Now, if you're, you need to consider why did the person get into the situation in the first place? Uh, diet nutrients probably played a role in it. But if the point at the point where candida is overgrown and the person's symptomatic, it's going to be difficult. Uh, and, and m most likely it will take a really long time. If you're going to be successful with the diet, it's going to take a really long time and a lot of specifics, like specific rotations of foods because they are metabolically resistant. You're going to have to sort of keep them on their toes. And so even if we're going to say, yes, it's possible, how practical is it? And how long does the person need to be sick? And how much of a stress is this going to be on their life? I just think that it's very practical also to think of those things. So the diet, 
with with specific supplementation, which we're going to talk about in a moment, this is really the most effective way to go about this. Now, supplementation alone without diet, it may work, but really the two are better together. Like I'm not saying I'm not saying at all with this that diet is not important. It's essential. Uh, but the you know, and if you do supplementation, you don't do the diet stuff. It might help for a while, and then when you stop supplementation, it's if you didn't change anything else in your diet and lifestyle, there's a good chance the candida might just come back. So I just want to try to be practical about this from the science perspective, as well as the lifestyle perspective, the behavioral perspective, how, how doable is this? What's the compliance? How long, how much longer is the person going to be sick if they go diet only approach? And also thinking about if, you know, if you're thinking from, no, I can do with diet and I just need to like, you know, uh, drink thyme and oregano tea every day. And maybe I'll take oregano oil and whatever. well, you're not doing just diet anymore. <laughs> you're doing, you're doing an herbal anti micro anti fungal approach at that point. Right. So also just realizing like at some point with, with quote unquote dietary kinds of things, you're crossing into antimicrobial supplementation. Phase one of this clinical protocol, there's going to be three phases, phase one, three months, phase two, three months. Okay. The first three months of this protocol, we're going to have three really targeted supplement formulas, Kanzita formula, remove, restore, and rebuild. Those are going to be the first three months. The dietary approaches that we're going to take are going to be what's called the MEVI diet for three to four weeks. And then uh, a low, a uh, low allergy or what basically what other people would call an elimination kind of diet for two to eight weeks. So the first thing we're going to do is go over the supplements in phase one. There's three of them. Remember the first one that I want to talk about is the can Zeta formula remove this this does two primary things in this uh, in this holistic supplement approach. It removes the excess candida number candida numbers, and it res- helps to restore eubiosis. This is a very unique formula that you're not going to find another formula quite like this one on the market. It's it, it does even more than just candida, which is part of the reason this is really important. It's broad spectrum meaning it kills a a broad range of bacteria and yeast and parasites. So if you think about it, just from that perspective, this is a really helpful formula, even in general dysbiosis, maybe not at such high doses that we're going to, you may not need such a high dose uh, if it's a general mild dysbiosis picture, but uh, this can be super helpful because it will help kill back bacteria that you don't want to be overgrown so that you can help repopulate with, with more healthy bacteria. And if there's just a little bit of a yeast issue, you could like, you can use this for that as well, along with the dietary approaches. And uh, one of the nice things about this is that it also works from, in terms of candida, this formula works from multiple different angles. So I've got the, the herbal ingredients that I want to focus on over here in the red circled. So all of these different natural products impact yeast in a different way. So we're not only trying to kill them by breaking their cell walls apart. We're not trying to only kill them by messing up their metabolism, you know, okay. Okay. We're trying to hit that at a bunch of different angles. So just from the killing approach, we're being holistic. And that makes a really strong argument for if, if there's no other reason, it's better to use a holistic supplement like Kanzita formula remove than it is to use say nice statin, because that's going to work in one way. And, uh, it's, and so can the candida evade that in some way? And it's not addressing any of the other dysbiosis. It's like saying candida overgrowth is the only issue. And as I've talked about, it's not really going to be the only issue. And I've actually seen, uh, I'm not anti-medication. 
Um, I just think that, and there, there is a time and a place for it, but I think that just in the general sense, this makes more sense. And what I've seen happen before is that if you use something like nystatin, that's just antifungal, doesn't infect parasites or bacteria, you'll decrease the candida numbers. But what about the enterobacter species or, you know, what about the parasites that were hanging out and that were an issue too? Now those have real estate and they can blow up and overgrow. And now you've got a health issue because of this other organism that's overgrown. And so do you go at that with an antibiotic and then you get yeast again, you know, so there's a little bit of a, a back and forth that can happen. And it's just better to use something holistic like this. And this is a really well put together formula. And I've also seen people, practitioners think I need three or four supplements to handle killing off all of this stuff. And you really, really don't. When, when you've got something that's, that, that's this broad and also holistic in the way that I was mentioning, you don't need five different supplements to handle a candida overgrowth dysbiosis situation. You need one really well put together formula and it will do the trick. So we're going to start with this at the very beginning. We can start slow. Every now and then it can be helpful to go uh, higher dose and fast. But in general, just remember the rule that, you know, gent simpler and gentle is usually better. And especially if you're working with somebody who's been sick for a really long time, just go gently, just start. This is a long-term relationship. This is a long-term lifestyle and diet approach actually, right? Like we're in the long term, those things have to be there to be, to have maintenance and not recurrence of, of candida and, and these gut issues. So we're remembering that, you know, low and slow is, is the best for most people. And so what we're going to do with this is we're going to start with one tablet. Most people are okay with this, but just test it out. One tablet a day, uh, three to four days with food. It's very important to take this with food. All of these supplements I'm going to mention, except there's a one little exception, but in general to take these with food because they're, they're sustained release. So they'll slowly release. Uh, okay. And so that's more helpful if you take that with food, one tablet, three to four days with food, the three to four days is just like, how are you doing with it? How are you feeling? How sensitive are you to it? If you have a good response, basically meaning like you, you feel okay. You don't have a negative effect from taking it. Maybe you will even feel like a little better from taking it, right? Good response, increase to one tablet twice a day. And I would say, do that for seven days. There's no hard, hard and fast rules to any of this. I just want to mention that now all of these things have nuance and we have to, it's again, it's the art of medicine. We have to meet the person that is in front of us where they're at. Um, so some people might just say, I'm just going to double it and I'm going to take one tablet twice a day for three days. And if I'm good, I'm going to increase. That's okay. I'm just giving you general rules. You can increase to one tablet twice a day. That's two tablets a day now for seven days. If they have a poor response, just back off a little bit decrease it to a half a tablet a day for three to four days and then, and then double it to ha uh, one a half a tablet twice a day, you know, just go slow if you need to. But the goal of where we want to get is really anywhere from one to two tablets, three times a day. So we're talking three to six tablets a day. I mean, if somebody was really sick and they had a really, uh, kind of severe over candida overgrowth case, maybe you would do well with nine of them a day even, but in general, the goal is going to be one to two tablets, three times a day of the candida remove. Now with candida formula remove this formula, candida formula restore though, these two together are are really a uh, kind of a foundation. These two would be the most important. If I had to say, what are the most important? Well, you really need to do both of these because remember Candida formula remove that's helping with eubiosis. And largely it's a broad spectrum, anti fungal, antibacterial, antiparasitic formula, right? 
this formula comes in and it does help in a different way, yet another holistic mechanism of action. It's helping to re- reduce the ex- excess number of candida in the gut, but it's this is a really important one to help restore eubiosis because this is a combination probiotic and enzyme. It's a really, uh, really good probiotic, and I'll tell you why here in a moment. It also gives functional digestive support. Okay, so what I'm listing is from that first list of eight things. What are these different formulas doing? So this is going beyond the first two things here, and it's increased functional digestive support, and it's going to help in- heal the intestinal barrier. So there's two aspects to this. The first one I want to talk about is the enzymes. So there's some different enzymes in here that do some different things. And the a couple of them, uh, you know, amylase, protease, these are these enzymes are about helping you break down the the basic nutrients uh, into their most simple form. It's just to help break down uh, and to support digestion and then absorption as much as possible of, of proteins and sugar. But then you got the cellulase, the hemicellulase. So these actually digest, break down yeast cell walls. So you can imagine the, the difficulty that these candida are having at this point. They've got all of these antimicrobial herbs and, and also the substances such as the caprylic acid and, you know, the fatty acids that, that impact them in different ways and, and make it hard. Their life's already hard enough. And now they've got these enzymes that are eating their cell walls. These two supplements work really well together for this reason. But also, uh, we're going to talk about the ceratiopeptidase a little bit more in the next slide, but this is anti-inflammatory and breaks down biofilms. So this is a really in- important and interesting ingredient, and you'll be hard-pressed to find this important ingredient in any other formulas that you're going to look at for candida. It's also a probiotic. And I think what's interesting to point out about this is, look, there's the, how many how many strains are there, uh, different strains are there here, bacteria? There's six. Now, if you think about most of your probiotics that you've seen, possibly most of them that you've used in practice, how many strains are in them? There's usually quite a bit, right? There's 10, maybe there's 20 different strains. It just depends. I've seen some with a lot of different strains. And so it's interesting to compare some of the differences that you see in the Kanzita supplements versus the others and, and to ask yourself why. And really it's kind of a similar answer as to like the, as to the Kanzita formula remove, you don't need five supplements when you've got one that's this intelligently put together and this effective. Same here. You don't need 20 different probiotic strains. You need six probiotic strains that are very well researched to be anti-fungal, anti-candida and to like, and to fight them back basically. These strains you can look them up in the research and you will see that there are many different studies that show when you put any one of these in candida has a very hard time colonizing and it has a hard time holding on to its real estate, so to speak. Right. Because these are very, these are very important, normal commensal flora bacteria. You want a lot of these. So it makes, it's, it's again, it's why, why not so many strains? Because it's not necessary when you're this specific. So that's, that's a really important thing to understand uh, when you're supplementing for folks is if you, if you hit as many angles to the problem that you're trying to solve as you can with, with one or two formulas, then you're going to probably have the most effect. You're going to have the most compliance from your patient as well. And you're going to see the best results. I put this slide in just to touch on ceratiopeptidase, or you'll hear it called serapeptidase. This paper is really cool. If you want to learn all about it, it's a 2020 article, the insights into the therapeutic applications of ceratiopeptidase. This image down here comes from it. These are the five main things they talk about in the paper. What I really want to just point out is it's anti-inflammatory. So this is helpful to cool that fire of inflammation. It's also anti-biofilm. 
Some of the other herbs in the Candida Remove, I didn't mention, but some of those have biofilm action as well. But really, like this is a big meat of this this nutrient, this ingredient in this formula. And ceratiopeptidase is actually made from a bacteria. It's a metalloprotease enzyme made from a certain type of bacteria. And one of the main things it will do is break down biofilms so we can use it in that way in this formula to help us with not letting the candida hide out. If we use this, uh, as I'm going to show you in a particular way, dosing this, we can help our antimicrobial herbal formula and fatty acid formula to be able to get to those candida even better. When you dose this, you're going to do one capsule twice a day. But the little trick that I want to make sure that you note here is that the first one you do with food, as I'd said earlier, this is the one little caveat to not taking these three supplements with food. This one you want to take one time a day away from food. So usually it's the easiest to do it before bed. You you know, if you, you'll see that if you're taking, you can take the supplements that you're going to take in this protocol, your patients can take them in the morning with food. This one, save one of them for away from food before bed. And that's because of the stratiopeptidase. You're going to get a better biofilm action if you don't have that enzyme in there amongst a bunch of food, essentially. And so that it can get there and, and help chew apart that biofilm a little bit. The goal of this is to reach two capsules a day for three to six months minimum. You can increase the dose of this to six capsules a day if you wanted, or if it was beneficial, because really, again, what are you doing? Well, you're giving these enzymes. Those aren't going to be help, or those aren't going to be hurtful to take in a higher dose, and the probiotics aren't going to be hurtful to take in a higher dose. So you don't have to take that many, but you can if you find it beneficial, or you could you could try increasing it for a, a month and then decrease it. You know, are some options, but at least two a day is. Uh, is important for three to six months, which is the, the six months is the first two phases of this protocol. And so really um, for most people who are symptomatic, uh, I would say, you know, the, the first two phases at least to take this as well as the Kanzita formula remove. This is the third supplement that we're going to have in phase one. This is the Kanzita formula rebuild. And I like that name because it's rebuilding your, your nutrient status and your reserves uh, is the first thing that I think of with it, but it's doing all these other things too. It's helping with eubiosis. This is a really important one for the inflammation and oxidative balance. It also gives functional digestive support. It also helps heal the intestinal barrier. And then this is the one to replenish nutrient status. You'll notice the other ones aren't really doing that. Uh, it, they might help, you know, the, the Kanzita formula, uh, restore will help with some of the nutrient breakdown from the enzyme perspective, but this is going to actually help replete the nutrient status. It supports the elimination systems. The other two weren't doing that either. Right. And I was saying at the beginning, how important this is. So this supports the elimination systems in the body, and then it also stimulates normal motility. So this brings up the slack of the other things that the, the first two didn't do this brings up the, the rest of it and really makes it such a holistic supplement protocol approach. Again here, nutrient repletion. And I just wanted to mention a couple of reasons that that's important. The, the first one uh, I would mention is the immune system, really the immune system nutrients that get depleted and, and that includes antioxidant nutrients. As I had mentioned earlier, those things, that capacity can get decreased, but we hadn't talked about mitochondria or adrenal glands really much yet. And this is one of the reasons I was saying earlier on, well, if you're thinking I left out adrenals, not only by addressing some of these root causes, will the adrenals, the adrenal function improve, but also this formula will really help the adrenal glands because of the nutrient content. And the mitochondria. So if somebody's got fatigue, 
there's a pretty strong chance you're you're safe to just make the assumption i think that there's some level of mitochondrial dysfunction maybe there's just not enough of what the mitochondria needs maybe the mitochondria is not quite working right because there's a lot of oxidative stress but in general right that the mitochondria is our energy producing powerhouse of our cells makes all the atp so I just want to point out that this is going to help people's energy because it's going to help. This is a pretty high dose multivitamin formula. And I have the serving size as two tablets up here in the red. And I, I just want to point out the reason I highlighted this is because if you compare this to probably, I would, I would argue probably any of the other multivitamins that you find on the market, look at the doses in this formula and that it's two tablets to get the dose of these nutrients. There's also all these herbs that I haven't talked about, but even just multivitamins, I spent a long time in my career trying to find a multivitamin where somebody didn't need to take six tablets to, to get the dose that I wanted, because it's very common to see six tablets as a serving on some of these multivitamins and, and so this is two tablets. So, you know, ask yourself why that is, what's going on. I mean, they can, we can get this dose with two tablets and all of these amazing herbs and we can do this with two tablets. Why do people need six tablets to get similar vitamin doses? Well, there's probably something else in there, right? filler or something like that. So you really need to consider the quality of a supplement when you're, when you're thinking about those types of things and what you're actually taking and what you're actually paying for. That's so important to consider. The, I'm going to talk on the next slide about the, this uh, proprietary blend that Kanzita has of, of these herbs and the, and the HCL. It's very interesting and it's really multifunctional in, in how it supports the body. It's part of the helping the heal the intestinal barrier and the functional digestive support aspect. I want to take a moment here just to focus in on Kanzita's proprietary blend in the Kanzita formula rebuild. The way I see this blend is that these five areas over here on the left, that these are the main areas that we're interested in for candied overgrowth, gut health, dysbiosis, etc. Carminative, demulcent, antimicrobial, HCL support, and bioflavonoids. Now, any one herb that you could take could you could talk about in a whole webinar on its own and many, many different things that it does in the body. Uh, so I'm not saying that this is exhaustive, but just in terms of our topic of conversation today, this is kind of where I see the most important things going on. And I want to highlight a few of these actions. Carminatives are, is an, a carminative is an herbal action. That's one of the ways that we understand in Western herb herbalism, what, how we might use a, a particular herb. We look at it, what are its actions and carminative as well as demulcent are herbal actions. Carminatives help to regulate peristalsis. They, they help promote regular uh, peristalsis and they are also antispasmodic to smooth muscle. This is really important for digestive function for, especially for people with a lot of gas and bloating and IBS symptoms. Remember that the muscles that line the intestines are smooth muscle. So when, when you take a carminative, if you're having gas and bloating, that regular peristaltic move it, movement will help to move the gas through. And if you're having pain, spa, a lot of times pain in the abdomen, uh, in the intestines is from spasming and this will help calm the smooth muscle. So it regulates, but it also helps calm. And it, the, these carminative herbs work wonderfully for general digestive distress and help helpful, uh, they're helpful for just like the regular functioning of the digestive tract. So when I see anise seed in this formula, that's like the first thing I think of when I see that, but chamomile also definitely is a carminative. Now, demulcents, demulcents are herbs that when they mix with water, they give you a, uh, viscous, sometimes a gooey kind of, uh, consistency. So slippery elm is, 
a really wonderful demulcent. And if you mix slippery elm powder, this is from the bark of a slippery elm tree. If you mix it with water and let it sit for a little bit, it's very similar to if you mix flax seeds with uh, with water. It, if you let it sit for like five minutes, it will get uh, thick and kind of gooey, I guess is the lack of, for lack of a better term. Slippery elm bark does this. And what that will do is it will, it, it will be anti-inflammatory to the digestive lining. It will coat the digestive lining and, and potentially help a little bit with the mucus layer. So demulcents are really soothing as well to an inflamed digestive tract. That's one of the first things I would recommend for an inflamed digestive tract would be and and including ulcers, if you have anybody with, with stomach or duodenal ulcers, demulcents are fabulous. They're very simple to use. Um, this happens to be in a, in a capsule in this formula. You can also use them just on their own in, in a, in a, as, a, as part of your diet, but it's really helpful in a supplement form like this to get them regularly. A lot of these herbs are antimicrobial, just adds to the antimicrobial, antifungal aspects of of this, uh, of this three formula phase. And then HCL support is, is really important for functional digestive support because not only is your stomach acid required to help break down macronutrients and to release minerals and vitamins from food, but it's also important to kill microbes that are coming through the stomach. So not having enough stomach acid or hypochlorhydria is a really strong uh, causative factor behind getting SIBO or SIFO. So small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. These things, if they're just getting through and they're not getting killed from stomach acid, that's one of the reasons that that can, that, that can contribute to those conditions. So candida overgrowth, like I said earlier, most of the time we're thinking of candida overgrowth in the small intestines and it can happen in, in the large intestine as well. But most of the time we're thinking the small intestine. And so part of the issue is if people don't have enough stomach acid, but the other thing, stomach acid is also important because when the acid chyme with all of the digested food leaves the stomach and goes into the small intestine in the duodenum, that is the primary signal. One of the primary signals besides the nutrients themselves for pancreatic enzymes to be released and for, for appropriate gastric and gastric emptying and intestinal transit to happen. The, the acid itself is a big part of that signaling process. You need people to have enough stomach acid. So that is super important. And I'll come back to that even later with a little bit of the functional, additional functional support ideas that you can do to support stomach acid, but that's really important. And so it's an awesome component to this, to this Kanzita formula rebuild. Bioflavonoids, the last thing there, the citrus bioflavonoids, citrus bioflavonoids, they're antioxidant, but what I really love about bioflavonoids in general is that they sort of calm an overactive immune system in terms of mast cells. They're stabilizing to mast cells. Now, mast cells are what re they'll release histamine. And so if there's immune dysregulation, sometimes mast cells will just pop off really easily and release histamine. And you can get a lot of like histamine can cause a lot of symptoms in the intestines and outside. So bioflavonoids are really nice to help stabilize mast cells and help them to not degranulate their histamines quite so easily. For the dosing of Kanzita formula rebuild, we want to get one capsule twice a day. You just take one with breakfast and one with dinner. If it's too hard to take two in a day, you can have your patients take two capsules once a day with food. But I like to spread these things out. It It's nice to keep... Uh, I think that to just keep levels of, of all of these supplements in the system throughout the day. And that's an important consideration with the Kanzita formula remove the first supplement that I didn't mention, but I have a slide coming up here where I will talk about some dosing considerations. And that is one of them is keeping these things in your uh, system.
as, as consistently as possible. So you really want to be on this, have your patients on this for three months, two capsules a day for at least three months is ideal. You'll help to rapidly replete these nutrients that are many of these nutrients are often low in patients with candida overgrowth. And many of these nutrients are essential for the immune system function. I'll just mention specifically vitamin A and D. Those are absolutely essential for the functioning of your gut immune system and the helping of regulation of your immune system. And then your uh, the local innate immune system, vitamin D is required to keep that healthy so that it can fight off candida and other bad bacteria to keep things away from the intestinal lining and to help you know, maintain balance, basically, eubiosis. That's a lot of, of, that was a lot of information. That's a lot of things to consider for three supplements, right? It's like I was saying for Kanzita formula remove, y- you could, a lot of people would think about three supplements just to do what that supplement does. But when you're this targeted, when it, it is a, it is a very uh, unique skill to be able to s- s- formulate supplements in a, in a quality way. And that's what you have here. And that's why you see that it only takes three supplements to do all of these things. These are all eight of the primary functions that I was mentioning at the beginning when I got to the protocol and I'm not even mentioning here supporting mitochondrial function and adrenal function, right? So there's even more than this. I think it's just quite incredible when you look at uh, all of the, uh, the other products on the market for gut healing and gut health, most of the time you'd have to take at least twice as many as this to do just what these three are doing. So those are the supplements in phase one. I just want to bring us back for a moment and remind us all that Phase one is three months. So there's three supplements that I just went over in detail. People are going to take those for three months. They need to do this along with diet. There needs to be some diet optimization. You're going to have to talk to folks and figure out how has their diet been? Where has it gone wrong, so to speak? And and then over a series of months, this isn't going to all happen right away, but over a series of months, we want to really optimize the person's diet, fix those primary issues that were there so that they become permanent lifestyle uh, behaviors, right? But also right away, what we want to do is do a candida diet that will support what all the supplements are doing, that will support the decreasing in the numbers of the candida, but also support eubiosis, okay? There are a lot of different candida diets out there. A lot of people have different opinions. I can tell you because there's so many opinions, the reason is because there's not a right answer. Okay. There's no one exact perfect diet for every single person. But what I can tell you is that there is in general what works and what is supportive. And then there might be some things that work, but they're very restrictive some diets are extremely restrictive. I've seen some candida diets that I'm so thankful I've never (laughs) tried to go on one of those because it's just so restrictive. And one of the main things that I tell my students in integrative and functional nutrition is wherever possible, don't be restrictive, be nourishing. You know, uh, life is hard enough and to be restrictive for an extended period of time with your diet in particular is, is difficult. And, and really undernourishment is, is probably more of an issue in a lot of these folks anyways, experiencing candida overgrowth for the dietary reasons that we talked about a while back. Right? So some are very restrictive. The approach that I want to share here is, is relatively restrictive, you know, compared to a standard Western diet but it's actually, it actually allows for a great amount of foods. It's just that it's whole foods. And I mean, in many ways, the typical Western diet is restricted 
you know, is restricted to a lot of processed foods and not a lot of whole foods and stuff. It depends on how you look at it. We're going to start with, uh, a diet that is ideally minimally restrictive. And then we're going to build, build up the dietary habits as we go. The first part of the diet is called the Mevi diet. It's meat, eggs, vegetables, and yogurt for three to four weeks. I'm just going to mention again that especially when we're talking about this diet stuff, there can be a lot of variation and, and nuance in terms of how long things go for. And that's when you, you know, all of that is about working with the person, you know, in front of you and, and how, how are they feeling and how easy are things or difficult and, you know, et cetera, you make those decisions on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So this is a general template that I want to share with you. The Mevi diet it is essentially a low carbohydrate diet. So glucose, while they, while candida species are very metabolically resistant, they, they prefer glucose and carbohydrates as their primary carbon source. So this diet is a low carbohydrate diet, but it allows almost all vegetables really. And, and then, high, and then high quality protein sources. So eggs, meat, chicken, fish, right? And then the yogurt I'll talk about in a minute that that might be an interesting one to people. And, um, I'll, I'll mention why that is in a moment, but what this diet is going to do because you're restricting the carbohydrates a bit then you're going to basically make these candida be on their toes. If they had toes, be on their, be, they're, they're, they're weakened. You know, they're more sensitive, most likely to antimicrobial treatment because they aren't in their optimal environment. So we're just, help, we're just along with the supplementation, we're also making their, their environment not optimal and turning back, getting a, you know, washing the system out a little bit. If that, like cleaning the slate a little bit, I guess is a better term so that we can build up healthy dietary habits where there maybe weren't before. And I know fruit is not listed here. Some people think that you can't have any fruit on an anti-candida diet, and that's not really necessary, at least not for most people. So it's not listed in here. I would say take it easy on fruit, especially at the start, uh, especially at the start, you know, take it easy on fruit. And if you do have fruit, I would really say lower, like it needs to be low sugar fruit. My favorite thing is berries. Berries are, have a ton of polyphenols. That's healthy for, uh, for eubiosis, for building up healthy gut flora and polyphenols tend to be antimicrobial. So, uh, I think berries are great. They're low sugar and they help with sugar cravings. Because folks are going to have sugar cravings if they got candida overgrowth and they have been eating a lot of sugar, the candida will tell them through the gut brain axis, it will tell them to eat sugar and their brain might tell them to eat sugar because they've been eating a lot of sugar depending on, on their situation. So they can help with sugar cravings. Berries and citrus are two pretty good examples of fruits that you can eat, you know, and still in moderation. Don't, don't be eating <laughs> berries all day, every day, but just, you know, it, it's, it can be a little fluid. We don't have to be so strict. Right. And oh, also with that, I like to recommend frozen berries for most people. You know, obviously if they're not in season, like frozen berries can be pretty affordable cup of blueberries a day. doesn't need to be every day, but a cup of blueberries in it. And once they're doing better, I recommend a cup of blueberries a day as a continued, uh, gut health program. But in this first phase, you know, every other day or whatever seems reasonable, whatever they're tolerating well. So yogurt is interesting in, in this uh, particular dietary approach, but the research is pretty convincing. And here's four research studies that I have. And if you want to go look at this, it's pretty clear that cultured yogurt has has an impact on preventing candida uh, overgrowth. And so it makes sense that it's in here, but it needs to be plain yogurt because if you look next time you're at the store, look at any yogurt that's vanilla or any other flavor and there's tons of sugar added into it. So it needs to be plain yogurt. Then that means that the sugar that's there is the naturally occurring sugar in the, the, in the, from the milk product 
but a lot of it's fermented, right? Because these are cultured and, you know, lactobacillus acidophilus is a common, is a common food-based probiotic that's present in yogurt. And that was also in the supplement formula, right? So we're just supporting it with this in the diet, how much it, it can depend. Could be a quarter of a cup or a half a cup a day. It could be a little bit more if they do okay with it. This is all about how is the person feeling? If they're getting better, it's okay if they're having a cup of yogurt a day, in my opinion, you know, it, it just, yeah, it's, it's a little bit one-on-one, you know, how you decide that, but it, this is a supplementary food probiotic. And I do think getting a little bit of it in every day is helpful. They could have a quarter of a cup twice a day, just whatever works for them. Right. I do think it's good to avoid some of the starchy vest- ve- vegetables for the first couple of weeks. <clears throat> you know, things like white potatoes, beans, squash, carrots, beets, things, vegetables that have higher amounts of sugar in them. You might decrease those things. Right. And, uh, we have a, a, a dietary handout in the description of the video below this, but just like another, just another option that you can think about is there are, because the ketogenic diet is so popular and it's, it's very low carb, right? There are a lot of different vegetable lists that people can use to figure out what vegetables won't kick them out of ketosis. Those vegetable lists can be helpful in addition to ours to know what vegetables are okay to eat, but it's most of them. Alcohol should always be avoided. It, alcohol will just feed candida. It's going to cause a lot of gut disruption. Alcohol unequivocally causes intestinal permeability. It's it's going to be an issue if the, if it maintain if it stays in the diet. In this first you know month or so of the Mevi diet, other considerations people ask about, and I've got some of this in the FAQ at the end. What about molds, moldy foods like blue cheese or whatever? I would say avoid it. Don't don't eat frankly moldy you know, things like, like blue cheese, um, there are going to be components that may just activate the immune system. The immune system is dealing with a lot already with the, with the fungus that's already there. Don't add more fungus into it from this perspective of like molds, uh, mushrooms. I got a question over here. I think mushrooms are fine. It's very clear that mushrooms are very beneficial to the immune system. And if I do recall, there's even some research showing that they might be anti-candida. I don't think there's any issue with mushrooms. I think that's going too far, in my opinion. Fermented foods? Well, yogurt's a fermented food, right? But other fermented foods? Absolutely. If you do fine with them, test it out. Like, if people are doing fine with them, uh, I think fermented foods are wonderful to get in every day. I try to do that. I think it's a, a good idea. Condiments and sausages? Sauces? have a lot of sugar in them most of the time. So that's part of this phase one. People need to clean out their cupboards from the junk. They need to clean out for sure any, you know, baked good, sweet sort of things, cookies and all that sort of stuff. But some of the places people don't always think about are things like a barbecue sauce or just different sauces. There's a lot of sugar in them. So they need to go through their fridge and they need to make sure that they're getting these sugar sources out if it's in the house, there's a good chance they're going to eat it. Just get it out of the house. It's just, you got to, you got to do that. Don't leave it up to willpower or the candida might make you eat it at some point. You never know. One additional consideration, because we're not often only dealing with candida and there's other dysbiosis and candida can cause IBS symptoms anyways, um, you might want to, if somebody's still having a hard time, say they're on the Mevi diet for a couple of weeks, if, the, if they're still having a lot of gas and bloating or IBS type symptoms, you, you want to maybe consider just decreasing FODMAP foods for a while, especially if there's a lot of bacterial dysbiosis. There might be a bit of an intolerance to higher FODMAP foods. This is, I'm not going to go into detail on this one because it's a bit of a different topic, but uh, it's worth considering. Those are foods that are high in oligo, dye, and monosaccharides and polyols. So these are highly fermentable short chain carbons that if there's dysbiosis, they'll ferment these things and it'll, it can cause a lot of discomfort for folks. So if there's a lot of that, just consider your people staying on the Mevi diet and just the vegetables that they're choosing to eat, have them 
choose medium to lower FODMAP foods for a little while during the MEVI phase, maybe, and then slowly add FODMAP foods back in. Okay, so that's maybe three to four weeks. This is really fluid. Again, this is a template. This, this low allergy phase is basically an elimination diet. And whether you have someone do this or not right now is, is honestly, it's very individual and, and very much how the person's doing. How are they handling the MEVI diet? Are they feeling really good? Do they just want to stay on the MEVI diet for a while? They're, are they? Do they feel like, I? it was hard at first, I got this down, and I'm feeling good. I just want to keep doing this for another month. I just want to keep doing the MEVI for another two month, another month or two. That's fine. If they're doing good, that's fine. What I want to say about this phase is that this at some point really need this really needs to happen for most people. It, it's just when it happens and how it happens has a lot of variability. So this from this template, I would say after about a month, consider trying this elimination diet or the low allergy phase of the diet, which could be two to eight weeks or more if needed, depending on some of these factors I'm going to talk about. The purpose of this is to remove any potential food allergies or sensitivities that someone might have and that they don't know that they have. The next phase is when we're going to reintroduce them. So th the way that a, an elimination rechallenge diet works is you eliminate a food, food category, or multiple. You eliminate them for at least two weeks. I think ideally eliminate them for a month, four weeks. And what you're looking for is for any symptoms that the person had to get better. That's how you know. And there are a lot of moving pieces to this, I understand, because there's already treatment going on. But in general, how it will work is you're looking for symptoms to change when you eliminate XYZ foods. Because, and then you can say somewhat scientifically that whatever I took out was impacting my symptoms. So you want to see, for, the first thing is you want to eliminate things and see something improve. But the, the, the next aspect of it, which we'll talk about is the reintroduction phase. And, that, and that's how you figure out if it's really a problem most of the time. Anything can be a food sensitivity or an allergy. There are common foods, there are common food categories that are troubles for people more, you know, more than others, but it can be anything. I know somebody who was having autoimmune was having an autoimmune flare a, a new autoimmune condition that came up and was having a flare and a lot of issues and she ended up figuring out that carrots was an issue she she did a really extensive elimination challenge and when she cut carrots out of her diet she got way better and if she has carrots it's but not a, it's bad it's not a good thing so it can be anything some of the foods to consider eliminating are ones that I have here, dairy, citrus, pineapple, banana. These are some that people will recommend. Soy, wheat, and gluten. And I put that because there are other gluten-containing grains, so you might want to consider, you know, and a gluten elimination eliminates not only wheat, it's barley and other, other grains, but wheat in itself isn't an uncommon allergy or food sensitivity to have soy potatoes not sweet potatoes is i mean white potatoes here corn and eggs so it's kind of interesting right to i'm mentioning dairy and eggs and you're like yeah but weren't you just telling people to eat those in the uh, for a month yeah it and you know there's no it's it, it's not perfect right if somebody's got a dairy sensitivity and you've got them eating the mevi diet like the yogurt might not be a good thing for them. You wouldn't necessarily know that. And if they already know they have an issue with dairy or eggs, they're not going to do that in the Mevi diet. Okay. That should be mentioned. So figure that out, you know, but uh, the reason that we're looking at this is because if somebody has got a food sensitivity, it's going to create an immune reaction in the gut and it will create inflammation and it will contribute to gut dysfunction and gut barrier dysfunction. So this is a really important part of healing the gut barrier and making sure there's not some other aggravating factor that's taxing the immune system and the essential function of the gut barrier beyond the candida, right? And if you're trying to figure out 
you know, a lot of these foods may have been eliminated in the MEVI phase. So there's that. And if you're not sure what to do, some people will do IgG food sensitivity testing and there's other food sensitivity testings. I don't tend to do them because, uh, from what I've seen, they're not, they're not rec- replicable uh, and they're not only, I mean, they're, they're not, they're not accurate in the sense yet. Yeah, like, yes, there may be an IgG re- a reaction to a food, but I've seen plenty that you can have a high IgG for a food and eliminate it and nothing changes. So just because a high IgG is there doesn't mean that that food's inherently going to be an issue. It might mean that they eat it a lot because it can be dose responsive to how much of the food they eat. So I'm just mentioning that, but sometimes if you have that information or you want to run one of those, sometimes they can be a really nice roadmap for a start of elimination diet. And you can say, well, these things were, these things were high. Let's start by eliminating those and see how you feel. Remember that people are already going through a lot. They've already probably I mean, the Mevi diet was probably a big change already from how they were eating. And this can be an additional stressor. This can feel like way too much for folks. So just remember this can be done slowly. If you need to do it slowly, you can do one food at a time. It's going to last longer, but you, you know, if, well, I guess what I want to say is if, if somebody decides, you know, after a month, I'm just not ready to do the low allergy phase I just need to stick with the Mevi diet increasing. I just need to stick with this increasing my vegetable intake. Um, That's already a new thing for me. That's fine. They should just do that if that's what they feel like they can do. And that's going to be really good for them, right? If they're increasing their vegetables and then they can maybe slowly start increasing some fruit if they want to do that as they start to heal. What I want to say is that this really should happen at some point unless the person just totally gets all the way better, it's, it's a really good thing for anybody that's experienced a chronic health problem to do this at some point. So outside of candida or any gut issues, anyone that you have with chronic health troubles should try this, at least the basic foods that are commonly problems for people, because you will find people with chronic headaches and joint pain and different things, you'll do this and they'll be like, oh my gosh, my joints have been so much better in the last two weeks or a month. And you're like, oh wow, I wonder, it must've been one of the foods, especially if you do this with no other treatment, it's really interesting. Wow, it must've been one of the foods. And then in the next phase, it's how we figure out if it really is an issue. So I just want to say, I like to have this here because people are already making change and let's figure this out if there's a food sensitivity or allergy, but if they're not ready for it, just do it at some point. And the other thing to know about an elimination rechallenge kind of diet is during the elimination phase, uh, it needs to be complete. It needs to be complete elimination. None of the food can be present. So, If they're avoiding dairy, I mean, don't eat butter. Don't think that butter might be okay. Butter is actually commonly not an issue so much for people with dairy intolerance problems, but don't just don't let any of it sneak in. Don't let any, don't eat anything that has any butter in it at all for that time frame, for example. So just make it a complete elimination to have the clearest picture possible. And Um, Just another thing to consider in this is I listed all those potential foods, but there's also some food categories that sometimes the category is a problem for people. We commonly think of these more with autoimmune conditions. These are some of the, you might try some of the food eliminations we talked about, but you might consider some of these broader family category uh, of food eliminations. So Solanaceae, not uncommon. There's a lot of alkaloids in the Solanaceae family as well as lectins. And lectins can be a problem for some people in their gut. This is tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, not sweet potatoes or yams. Those are a different family, but regular white potatoes and others are in the Solanaceae family. And then there's herbs to think about in that family as well. Uh, uh, Belladonna, you wouldn't be giving Belladonna. Uh, Ashwagandha is in that family. Goji berries are in that family. So there's a few other things to think about, but eliminating the whole family for two to four weeks at least, and then re-challenging it 
might be interesting. Legumes listed there and grains. Sometimes, sometimes those broad, broad categories people have issues with. Just one other option that you might, you know, because people already eliminated stuff with the Mevi diet, maybe they just want to try instead of restricting more or anything like adding things in. So maybe there's something they're missing. Maybe they are missing fruit. Maybe they're like, I love pears and I just really want to eat a pear. You're like, okay, well, let's just try it. Let's see what happens. How far have you gotten with your candida treatment so far? Do they have bloating and gas and discomfort? Do they have some other flare of a symptom? Maybe they can start adding in a little bit more fruit already, you know? So there's just some considerations you can have during this phase. And I want to just mention for follow-up, four to six weeks really is the earliest that I think it should be for most people. This is kind of in general, my general rule for chronic illness in general. Uh, six weeks is kind of where I like to go. You don't want to reevaluate people too soon. There's a lot of up and down. There, It's too... It's Looking from week to week at how things are going can sometimes be a little too focused and you're missing the larger picture that, oh, it was good this week, it was bad that week, good this week, bad that week. If you just look week to week, you might not know that they were actually improving. But when you look six weeks later, you see that where they're at six weeks later is better than where they were at at the beginning, you know? So just don't hone in too close. When they come in, you want to ask about every symptom that they shared at their first visit. Don't just focus on chief complaints. Maybe they came in with digestive troubles, but when you were taking their history in the review of systems, you found out that they, that they also have a skin issue and they get joint pain or something. You want to ask about all those things that came up in the first visit. Don't only focus on the gut. For example, ask if there's anything new, if there's any new symptoms that showed up, that's you know, interesting and it helps guide you on the trajectory of, of your treatment plan. Ask about the supplement consistency. Have they been able to take it when you recommended they take it? If not, when have they been taking it? And, and same with the diet. What's the consistency? Because if they come back and they aren't improved to the level you expect, maybe it's not the treatment plan. Maybe it was that they weren't able to be consistent or compliant. So find out those things and find out what's been difficult. Just ask them, uh, has there been anything that's been hard or difficult in this process? Because that will, you know, that, that will help build trust and rapport for, for one thing. And then it will also help, you know, just from a practical perspective, what you might be able to do to support them. You know, if something's been difficult, how can you change it? Maybe it's been difficult to take two pills, one pill twice a day. Maybe that means you just change it to two once a day, right? Uh, you want to get ready for the elimination diet too. I would say have the visit, don't have them start the elimination after the first, the Mevi diet, you know, don't have them start the elimination phase without talking to you. So get that, get that visit in. And if they're going to do that, prep them for it and how they're going to do it and what foods and et cetera, and give them encouragement. If you need to be a little bit of a cheerleader, I think that's okay because this can be difficult and point out what people are doing well point out what's going well. If their symptoms are 10% better, point out that their symptoms are 10% better. You know, you were having, you were having diarrhea this many times a week and now it's only been once a week or whatever, you know? So just be optimistic, I think is important and encourage people to keep going because they will just keep getting better and they will thank you in the end. Phase two is three months long as well. This is a little bit simpler than some of the moving parts in the first phase. We're three months into this. The person is essentially switching out one supplement for another one. They're going to maintain Canzita formulas, remove and restore. That's the probiotic enzyme and the remove is the antimicrobial, antifungal formula. Now we're just taking out the Canzita formula, rebuild the multivitamin and with the other functional herb support in it. And we're putting in Canzita's formula recharge. And we'll talk about that here. And then the diet, we're going to move into the reintroduction phase. If indeed we did do the elimination part of the diet. Canzita's formula recharge is also a multivitamin of sorts. So it provides the nutrient repletion in a continued way that that the rebuild formula did. It also provides functional GI support, just a little bit different than the rebuild formula helps detoxification. It helps 
continuing repairing the gut barrier from a slightly different perspective than the rebuild formula. And it further supports eubiosis. So this switch to the Kanzita's recharge formula really carries us forward in some of the same ways in some new ways. Kanzita's formula recharge is a combination of still a multivitamin, but what you'll see here is that while there's many of the same vitamins and minerals, they're in different doses, a little lower doses, because by this point, we should be getting an improvement in our diet as well as increasing digestion, digestion and absorption capacity. So this should be a, a, a maintenance sort of formula for uh, supporting what we're already getting through our diet. But some some of these are still really important for our antioxidant function, our immune function, and so on. But in addition to that, what I really want to bring attention to is down here at the bottom. L-glutamine is one I want to bring attention to. L-glutamine is a preferred energy source for colonocytes. So they will use uh, L-glutamine as uh, an energy source to basically do their job and do it well. And part of that job is maintaining a healthy intestinal barrier. So the research on L-glutamine... Uh, corroborates that and shows that L-glutamine helps to heal a, a, an intestinal a permeable intestinal barrier or leaky gut, as people commonly call it. The other thing I want to bring your attention to is this Larix Laricina heartwood extract. This is a conifer tree that has arabinogalactin in its heartwood. And so this is an extract of that. And an arabinogalactin is a non-digestible carbohydrate. You'll see this uh, abbreviated as NDC. And it's called that because we can't digest it, but the bacteria in our gut can digest it and they love it. And so what we'll see with this is that it will increase, uh, it will be a really good food basically for all of the healthy bacteria in our gut. And so this is a really nice addition to the fiber and the prebiotics that we're increasing in our patient's diet. This is going to be a really nice supplement to continue. You know, we've been, we've been populating and building up healthy bacteria, healthy gut flora. This is going to really take that to the next level and help build that up. I'm not going to talk about every ingredient here. The other couple that I want to bring your attention to. So matcha it, and elagic acid are really potent antioxidants and uh, will, will help to keep a healthy oxidant balance in the intestinal milieu. And matcha is, green tea is one of the healthiest plants on the planet for human beings. I think that that's very fair to say based on the research that we see. The amount of the amount of beneficial effects it has is astounding. So I think just by having the antioxidant effects, the cardiovascular effects, the brain effects that matcha green tea provides is awesome to have in here in, in somewhat of a maintenance formula as we're going to talk about it. It also provides some really great hepatoprotective and, and liver supportive nutrients. Milk thistle seed is excellent at supporting liver health. It's hepatoprotective and we, you know, we need our livers to do their its detox job. And we're all inundated with toxins, whether we like it or not from our environment all day, every day. And, um, even if we're eating as clean of a diet as we can, et cetera. So this is a really great support long-term and taurine as well. Taurine will speed up the liver detoxification pathway. So in, in general, just with the vitamins and minerals, just the things that I mentioned here are very powerful for foundational body system support, being the liver, the detox pathways, eubiosis, and antioxidant and anti-inflammatory support. Recharge can be taken one scoop a day and with or without food. It really, it's up to, it's up to you because there is quite a bit of protein in here. If you see in the other ingredients down there, we have rice protein and pea protein, as well as some me medium chain triglycerides, which uh, provide really awesome energy support and satiety. And so it can just be on its own if you would like uh, one scoop, or you can like, ha you can have it with food, put it in a smoothie. It's okay either way. And so it also provides a nice amount of amino acid support there. And one scoop a day, the doses of remove and restore can stay the same as phase one, or you can modify them as needed. Now I would say 
The Kanzita formula restore, keep it the same. The Kanzita formula remove just depends on what approach you're taking and how the person is doing. I'll talk about some dosing considerations in a minute, but it also could just remain the same because you're going to stay on those. I would say really keep people on those two, at least, you know, six months is for most people is going to be important to get them in a really good spot. The goal of, of the recharge formula is really to be more of a long-term, long-term multivitamin and, and natural energy supplement and also, also supporting healthy gut flora and intestinal barrier function. We want these things present, hopefully in the long term, because this is going to be supportive to not getting back into the situation, to not having a relapse, if you will, of dysbiosis or candida overgrowth. Now the reintroduction phase, most of the people are very, very happy to get to this part if they did the elimination part because it was a bit restrictive depending on how many foods and, and so on that they did. And especially if they took something out that they really loved, they're really happy to do this part. So you want to reintroduce a food one at a time. This is kind of the most important thing besides doing it long enough and being making sure that none of the food was there during the elimination phase. This part is really important in that you do one food at a time and you need to wait a few days because there can be, there can be, uh, uh, delayed reactions with some of these foods could be a couple days later. So wait at least two days. I would say you may even just wait, a, just depending, you might just wait a, a week and just see how is the person doing if they add this back into their diet in general. But what you're doing is you're re-challenging the food in its purest form. So dairy, I would say milk. It's got all of the components, the protein, fat, and carbohydrate, sugar, the wheat, you know, wheat berries, or just like a basic whole wheat bread. Don't get some cheap store-bought bread, you know, have a decent, have a ideally like a fermented sourdough, but do something in its most whole form. Soybeans could be, soy could be soybeans or tofu, what you're doing is you're looking for a reaction when you reintroduce these foods. So people are happy to reintroduce foods, but they're not so happy if they have a reaction. However, I will say if somebody discovers a food allergy or a food sensitivity or a food intolerance, those are all three different things slightly, but if they discover any of those, then while they may not be happy that that was an issue for them, they will be empowered and be happy in the long run that they, that they have some control and know this is an issue. And if I choose to eat it, I can choose to feel like crummy the next day, but they're in the driver's seat then, right? Because a lot of these go on for a long time, years, a lifetime really sometimes. And people don't realize that it's an issue and that they felt worse than they, maybe they thought they were doing okay. And they actually realized after they figured out the food that was an issue that they weren't feeling as good as they thought. It's kind of interesting that way. The signs and symptoms could be anything, but in general, what I would say is you're looking in an ideal world, you're looking for certain, any symptom, any complaint the person has, you're looking for those things to improve when they eliminate and for them to flare up and come back when they, when they test the food out. Common things people experience are headaches, brain fog, digestive upset, gas bloating, maybe achy joints and muscles, and then skin stuff. Those are what I would say are maybe the more common kinds of reactions people will have from a food sensitivity or food problem, allergies. But any susceptible body system can be affected. So just remember that. And especially, you know, if somebody's got chronic symptoms and it's even if it's a non candida related symptom, if they have had, if they had this 10 years ago and they didn't have a candida issue until a year ago, say, especially if it's a chronic issue and that gets better, that's, that's really, that's a nice little symptom to see improve with an elimination. And if that comes back when they re challenge, you know, you can pretty say, you say pretty clearly that, that the food was a contributor or the primary issue in that if there's a symptom that occurs from rechallenging, their food really needs to be avoided long term because it's causing an immune activation in the gut and it could be contrib contributing to intestinal permeability and gut dysfunction. So it really does need to be taken out long term. And that's kind of the point of it. And if they do fine with the rechallenge, if nothing seems to change, nothing happens, then they can add it in. They can bring it back into their diet. 
Phase three is ongoing. So this will bring us to the six month mark. And really at this point, ideally we wouldn't need to be doing any more of the removing, you know, killing of the candida so much. Ideally at this point, levels of candida are back to kind of normal under control. We have a eubiotic gut mi microbiome environment, and now we're just doing maintenance support. So the diet should really be anti-inflammatory in general, an anti-inflammatory diet. And that is like kind of a big conversation, but in general, that means it's a plant focused diet. It's whole foods plant focused. There's many different styles throughout the world. Different cultures have different ways of having an anti-inflammatory healthy diet. Uh, so the, the main things that you usually see are that they're whole foods, plant focused. You're getting plenty of omega-3 fatty acids, you're getting plenty of fiber. Okay. And you're just building at this point, you're just building upon what hopefully they've built some good habits over the last six months. And I would say have people continue with the recharge formula. Kanzita's recharge formula is a really great maintenance formula. It's got a good level of amino acids and pro, you know protein and amino acids. It's got fundamental baseline vitamins and minerals and, uh, and not in doses that are too high to also be with a healthy diet. It's just kind of a nice supplement to a healthy diet. And then all of those other things that I was talking about that help to maintain just healthy liver function and healthy gut function microbiome, right? So that people can avoid this from returning. Management. This is always a big conversation when we're talking about people who have had chronic illness and, and just when, how do you, how often do you see people? How often do you follow up and manage? You know, I would say with the management, once people were in a good spot, see them a few months later, make sure things are still good a few months later. If they are, I would say check in with them six months from there. And then if they're good, you can talk. Maybe they don't need to see you anymore. Maybe they see you once a year, but just make sure you just check in on them. You know, don't just let them be good and then go things happen in life. So that's how often I would say maybe to see people, uh, remember being an opportunistic uh, organism, candida will overgrow again, most likely if it's been given the opportunity. So all of these things need to really stay in place that we, that, that we, the things that were contributing to the candida overgrowth in the first place need to, need to need to be either present if they weren't or absent if they were there and to maintain long-term health. Cause that's what we're trying to do. Restore health and then maintain it long-term. You can continue with the remove and the restore formulas if symptoms aren't resolved at this point. And you can also, you can bring them back. You know, if, if they're doing good and there's something happens, you can bring them back. Cause you know, the purpose of these two supplements now, cause I've described them to you in pretty good detail, you, you understand what they're for. And I think through that, how to use them, you know, when things come up for folks, we'll talk about dosing considerations in a moment. And I, I would say, you know, if, if the symptoms come back in the same way and you, it, you're probably pretty safe, assuming that it's candida overgrowth again, or some of the same issues again, and maybe you just treat again, but ideally, you know, you probably would like to see a comprehensive stool analysis if you can, or an organic acids test. But if you're going to look for candida, do a comprehensive stool analysis. That's the best way to guide your treatment. If you're not really clear. And dosing considerations, this is mainly around the candida formula remove. So always meet people where they're at in terms of how they're responding to the dose increases you're doing and consider a slow titration. As I had said earlier, you don't need to go in a hurry with this. You'd be better off slowly increasing the dose over a month and then getting to the peak dose that you want and staying there for four to six weeks. That's what I would recommend. Stay there for at least a month or six weeks. If you can, you'd be better off going slow and taking a month to get to the dose you want to get to and then staying there for a month and then then, then trying to do it too fast and the person has a hard time or a lot of die off reaction or something like that. So, you know, consider that. And then what you could also consider is taking a break or lowering the dose for a week or two. They stay at the peak dose for four to six weeks. Maybe, maybe you like lower the dose down, see how they do with a little bit lower dose. And then you go back up for another four to six weeks. Those are just some considerations, but I would say give them at least a good month or month and a half at the max dose before you give a break at all, you know? keep it in the system. 
The last part of this that I want to talk about. So the diet and supplement approach is really fundamental baseline. You're going to see people get better. If you do all this stuff in addition, as you can, you're going to, you're going to see even better results most likely because uh, these are, a lot of these are what I do in my practice. I've done some of these things just on their own plenty with people with just minor digestive, you know, troubles and will, you know, just by supporting the function of their digestive system, things will rebalance themselves and work well. So uh, I want to touch on a few things that are really great that I've seen just consistently help with folks with digestive things, digestive disorders and dysfunctions. Digestive bitters, they're called this because they support the digestive system. Bitter things are usually typically people are doing a tincture form of, of different herbs. Those are the most common, but there's foods, there's bitter melon, which is pretty awesome helps with blood sugar regulation as well. But what I do with this is five to 15 drops, five to 15 minutes before meals. So what it will do is uh, by putting the bitters on the back of the tongue, which is where the bitter receptors are, you will stimulate the vagus nerve. This is the best. uh, So you can see over here is the best I could find for the innervation of this area. Now what they show is the glossopharyngeal nerve innervating the back of the tongue. And that's true. That's most of the bitter receptor, but the vagus nerve also innervates the back of the throat where the gag reflex is, but also the very back of the tongue. So when you get something bitter and you stimulate that, you'll stimulate the vagus nerve. And what does the vagus nerve do? Well, the vagus nerve innervates the first two thirds of the digestive tract and all of the organs, essentially uh, liver, for example, pancreas. So And the vagus nerve, so it regulates exocrine function, for example. So what you're going to do by stimulating the vagus nerve, you're going to stimulate digestive function to begin. You, a lot of times, if you do bitters, strong bitters, you will feel your stomach gets kind of growly. You'll feel a little hungry even. And that's the point. We're stimulating digestion. We're preparing for digestion. I will usually do this before meals, but sometimes I'll just have people, if I feel like they need to stimulate peristalsis and digestive function system throughout the day. I'll have them four or five times throughout the day. Even if they're not going to be eating, just put some bitters on the back of your tongue. Common. These are easy to get most of the time in, you know, grocery stores and, and even like drink alcohol sections because people use these to make alcohol mixed drinks and things. So you can get simple ones that have one herb like gentian is really common, but chamomile, not, uh, and people don't always think of this, but chamomile actually is quite a bitter herb if you have it, at least in like a tincture form. Andrographis, I think, is also called the king of bitters. It's a really cool antimicrobial herb, but here we're using it because it's super bitter. 515 drops. Cardamom tincture, also really bitter. This is it's really simple to do, and it's really, really powerful, actually. I just want to talk about more carminatives. So there's some carminatives in the formulas that we talked about, but I also just want to revisit some, I think the more carminatives you can get in besides supplementation, such as in tea format is really great throughout the day too. This is really helpful for folks. And uh, again, they stimulate parasolsis, the relaxed smooth muscle. Common ones are fennel. Caraway is probably the strongest one that I'm aware of. Caraway tea is probably not very good. I've never done that, but fennel, peppermint, ginger, lemon balm, chamomile, any form is fine. I think tea is nice, but you know, people can do tinctures if they want. And I would say have them do it a few times a day, or if they just need something in the evening before bed to relax with, make it a carminative tea blend. You could have people get a tea blend of these, uh, or, or a tincture combination, those sorts of things. Uh, and pill and supplement pill forms work well as uh, work fine as well. But I just think that uh, this is an important one be, with the bitters to add in because you're really providing beyond what they're already doing. I've seen these things help people so much with, with different types of you know gas and bloating and uh, low stomach acid by supporting the digestive juices to start going with the bitters. So these are, these are really helpful. They're easy. They're easy to do all these things. Fiber really, I don't think can be overstated. And I think that fiber is probably, I don't know how do you pick a most important nutrient, but fiber, we don't think of it as a nutrient so much necessarily all the time, but it's, I don't know, maybe the most important nutrient if I was going to pick one. 
it always comes to the forefront of my mind because we know how important the gut microbiome is to us and our gut health and fiber is how we perpetuate that. Basically that's the food for the, for the, the microbiota, the bacteria anyway. So beyond food, right? Obviously we want a whole foods, plant focused diet, lots of fiber, lots of different types of fiber, soluble, insoluble, et cetera. But uh, beyond that, psyllium husk can be super helpful. Psyllium husk is the hu- seed husk from the plant, Plantigo ovatum, and or it's a type of plantain is what it'll be called. Not plantain, like the one that looks like the banana, but it's called plantain. And five to 15 grams daily. And, you know, uh, I will, I like to use psyllium husk powder. You know, people can just put it in water and drink it down and put it in a smoothie or whatever. But I think additional fiber is extremely helpful to get them to the doses you want them to be at. If they're not, if they're having a hard time increasing their fiber through their plant intake, then you're going to maybe go up higher in the dose of psyllium husk. And maybe if you want to get to 15 grams a day, say do it, split it into twice a day or something. But what I wanted to point out with fiber here is that, you know, this paper was showing they're they're saying that it's possible that ancestral humans may have consumed as much as a hundred grams of fiber a day. That is incredible. And now people in North America have 17 grams of fiber a day. So what impact does that have on our ability to excrete toxins because that binds up if binds up bile, which is where our toxins are to get rid of them. That's one of the reasons fiber is huge. What kind of, what are our bowel movements like compared to our ancestors and what is our gut microbiome like compared to our ancestors if they were actually eating hundred grams of fiber a day right now, the RDA, which is the recommended daily allowance in the United States, that was given by the USDA, 14 grams per thousand calories. So even if somebody's having a 2000 calorie diet, they're getting 28 grams. I work people towards 30 to 50 grams a day. I think that that makes way more sense based on, this right here, for example, but with fiber, you just want to go slow. Just remember that if people haven't been eating a lot of fiber and they start increasing it too fast, they might, depending on what type of gut issues they have or gut milieu, they might get a lot of gas bloating discomfort. If they got a lot of constipation, fiber is helpful, but you better increase a lot of the water by a lot because you don't want to make it worse and give them impacted bowel or something. So Go slow with fiber. If you're going to supplement with something like psyllium husk, start with two grams a day. And just, I don't, you know, just see where they do. You don't want to give somebody 10 grams of fiber and supplementally, and then they get a bunch of bloating and cramping and pain and stuff. Uh, so just go slow again, but get it up there. If you can get the fiber up, I think to at least 30 grams a day. There are some particular foods and food food categories and nutrients that I focus in on as well. So people are already right at the start eating the Mevi diet. I'm going to have them start eating a lot of brassica daily, eat brassica daily, and ideally allium family foods daily if possible. Brassica is broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, all of those. These have immense physiologic benefit. So they help with liver detoxification. They also help with the health of the gut immune system. So inside the cells of the intestines, there are intraepithelial lymphocytes. And on those cells, there are these receptors that basically these receptors have to be stimulated consistently to, to keep the cell alive. If these cells, if these receptors, ACH receptors are not stimulated, the cells will not survive. And there's obviously things that stimulate them in the natural environment of the gut, like the microbes, the microbial milieu. But brassica family vegetables have a molecule in them that binds to this ACH receptor and stimulates it. So you're basically keeping your gut cell immune system alive when you eat brassica family vegetables. They're really amazing. They're supportive for hormone function as well and everything. So daily get those allium families, onions, shallots, garlic, they're antimicrobial, they're antioxidant, uh, garlic it helps with healthy lipid levels, etc. But allium daily, just get people eating those daily if possible. And then once they're to a good spot, you know, where they're eating more, more healthy 
levels of fruits and things. I think berries, like frozen blueberries, one cup a day is pretty good idea. The research shows that that's, that that level supports a healthy gut microbiota. Omega-3 fatty acids, people don't get enough of these. Now, I I like people to get EPA and DHA because of their potent anti-inflammatory components, you know, or their, their effects. But, but also just remember that alpha, alpha, uh, linoleic acid, no linolenic acid, alpha linolenic acid is is the precursor to those. Now your the human body cannot make a great deal of EPA and DHA from those. We usually get higher amounts of EPA and DHA from fatty fish. For example, you can also get it from algae, but uh, I have people increase the EPA and DHA like couple times a week, get fatty fish. Small fish are nice because they're lower in heavy metals. So sardines, anchovies, those sorts of things can also supplement with those things. But you know, from a diet perspective, I want people to get them ideally. And the ALA have people increase, start having them incorporate chia seeds or, and walnuts and flax seeds. Those are really important because they're not only anti-inflammatory, but the omega-3 fatty acids, the EPA and DHA, they are responsible for the resolution of inflammation. There are certain molecules in the body called resolvins and marisins and others that are required for the inflammatory process to resolve. So if somebody has acute inflammation and doesn't have enough of those, then the inflammation may not resolve necessarily as it should, and it can go chronic inflammation. So that's important. Organ meats. I like organ meats because, especially liver, because and and two times a week might be a lot really for people, but you know, one, once, once a week is awesome for a while. At least I try to eat, you know, this once a month, but for someone who's been, been sick and trying to get better, like if they can do this, I think it's nice because it's like nature's multivitamin and there's a lot of vitamin A and uh, the liver in particular is really awesome, but just make sure that people are getting it from a very clean animal, pasture raised animal. And as clean as possible because what's going through the liver is all the toxins. Right. But if it's a clean animal that, that, you know, was like a cow that was eating grass its whole life and was in a clean place, et cetera. Like, I think that that is one of the best foods that you could have people start eating is organ meats. We don't eat. I don't think we eat enough of that in our culture, to be honest and fermented foods daily. So we yogurt was in the Mevi diet originally, but sauerkraut or, or here where I live, we, uh, there's a brand that sells fermented pickles. We buy those things. I try to have fermented foods every day. I'll even just sip on a little bit of the juice from the sauerkraut or the fermented pickles. You can get fermented olives sometimes every single day, just a little bit, uh, it is, is really beneficial to maintenance of gut health. Not, not only it'll help you, it'll help people get better from, a gut dysbiosis dysfunction issue, but it will be a primary factor also in the maintenance. In summary, I have laid out the three phases here and the functional support that I mentioned. I think this is a really nice way to visualize it. We talked about a lot of awesome information. Go back and listen to it as you need to. And also just see if you, when you look at this, you can kind of remember what's going on in here and why the phase one, three months, we're going to have Kanzita formulas remove restore and rebuild. And then we're gonna do the Mevi diet for three to four weeks. And if we can, after that, do the low allergy diet phase. Phase two will be the next three months. And that's, we're going to stay on the Kanzita formulas of remove and restore, but we're going to add in recharge and, and take out rebuild. The recharge will replace that. And we're going to start doing a reintroduction diet phase of the foods that we eliminated and seeing if there's any reaction. Phase three is ongoing. And we're just going to keep taking the the recharge as a, as a multivitamin and gut and immune system maintenance formula, right. And to help us maintain what we've gained and just prevent any relapse issues, for example. And uh, I also put the reintroduction diet on phase three, because just to recognize, depending on how, how many foods and how, when you did the low allergy diet, the elimination low allergy diet phase, you, you may be in to phase three and still reintroducing foods and just depends. You just do that for however long it needs to happen for. And the functional support, the main things I focused on were bitters and carminatives, fiber, and then some specific foods that I just touched on. 
And what you are going to see when you do this are faces this happy. These are going to be the results that you see when you do Candida's Candida Overgrowth Protocol. You're going to see people's lives change because it significantly limits people in their ability to show up in their lives the way that they want to. It limits people's ability to go on trips, to do things with their kids and their grandkids, and to just feel well and vibrant and vital in their life every day. And so when you help someone really restore their health in this way that I've been talking about, you're going to see amazing results and you're just going to see people overjoyed and just so thankful that you were able to guide them on this journey. I wanted to go over some frequently asked questions here briefly. We talked about a few of these already. What about sensitive folks in terms of dosing is what I was thinking here. Um, Because people will want to know about this. They've got somebody who's really sensitive. So if you have a patient who's really sensitive, it's like, gosh, it doesn't matter what I give them. Even the most gentle things, it seems like they react negatively. You want to start really small, especially with the antimicrobial. They probably won't have an issue with the Candida formula restored and rebuild or recharge, but the removed formula is killing Candida off. So if they're really having an issue with one, starting out with the one a day, you go to half and see how they do for at least three to four days with a half a tablet a day with food. If they're really sensitive to that, then you just go lower. It's really unlikely you're going to need to do that, I think. But if you needed to, you'd, you'd try to cut it into a quarter of a tablet and then you slow, you work up as slow as the person needs to, but they're probably uh, in part sensitive because of this candida overgrowth problem. There may be genetics and other things involved, right? But uh, that's just in general, it's probably, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You just need to go to a lower dose and you just need to increase it slow. Don't be in a hurry. And work on the diet first. If you need to go to a, that low of a dose, or maybe you just stop supplementing at first with the candida formula remove. Maybe you just try the other two supplements and you just work on getting their diet really good. And that's possible that that's going to help decrease the candida numbers enough and build up some healthy ba- gut bacteria enough that then they do okay when you try to bring the, when you bring the remove formula in again. So just consider that. I already talked about the diet stuff there, the mushrooms, fermented foods, bread. I would say, you know, Ideally, don't eat bread for a couple of weeks. And if you eat bread, it needs to be actual fermented sourdough type of bread. Don't go crazy on it, but a little bit might be okay. I mean, really during the MEVI phase, if you can just not eat bread for four weeks, that would probably be good because we want to keep the carbohydrates lower since it's their preferred food source. But I, again, I think nourishment is the biggest thing. If people are doing okay, even if they're eating a food that you're that in your mind you think they shouldn't be doing that, it's not good for candida overgrowth. If they're doing okay, they're doing okay. And just, you know, let people enjoy their lives and nourish themselves as much as possible is how I look at it. The duration of treatment just depends on all these factors and more probably. Severity, duration of how long how long have they been sick, duration of illness, the level of overgrowth. The more there was, probably longer it's gonna take. The morphology, you're not going to know this, but you know, if they had a really invasive kind of uh, situation, then that might take a little longer because there might be biofilms more and stuff like that. So just consider, uh, you know, it can just plan on six months, three to six months, uh, just kind of have your template of getting everyone through the first six months and then just reevaluate. Do they need to keep going with the remove, for example? And you improvise as needed. I like to say play jazz. You just improvise and that's the art. That's, I, to me, that's a lot of the fun part. That's the humanistic part of practicing medicine. Is it okay for children? I just always, I've, I've never treated candida overgrowth in a young child. There may be a need to deal with parasites, especially like more than candida overgrowth. I mean, it's possible in a kid for sure, but a lot of different places in the world, parasites might be a more of an issue and the Kanzita formula remove will work for that most likely. But I always, with that sort of thing, I always, at least if I don't refer to a pediatrician, I at least ask their advice specifically because of there's, there's dosing, there's dosing by weight for sure, but there's also age considerations 
And you just, you know, I, I don't want to give advice on children here on the webinar, but just get advice from a pediatrician and ideally somebody who is integrative and holistic in their thinking and, and that has done this before and just say, Hey, like this is, I love using this, this formula, uh, this antimicrobial formula. I have this, I have this nine-year-old or whatever it is. I, I, I would like to know your opinion on what dose would be safe. I would say that's your best route if you don't work with kids. Quality control is another thing I want to mention. People want to know if they're, you know, what's the quality control of Kanzita products and it's top notch, uh, really. So the manufacturers themselves will, will test the products to see, you know, what's their, uh, is the, is it what it's supposed to be there? Is that in it? What levels? Uh, are the uh, fungus bacteria, is any of that present, that sort of testing. So that quality control is there, but then Kanzita really goes above and beyond after that they u- do Eurofins testing and Eurofins is a, is a worldwide leader in bioanalytics testing and they're testing for allergens of all sorts. So when, you know, fish and egg and dairy, et cetera. So when Kanzita says this uh, is free of these allergens, you can bet that it is because it they went they went above and beyond to make sure that it was so the quality control uh, is really great for Kanzita products and then if you're wondering if we have free resources absolutely we have all kinds of free resources there's a shopping list there's a symptom tracker there's different handouts that are supportive along the way for patients uh, if you want any of those just go into the link uh, the video in the video description below this there will be links to the resource page with all of those things. And as a practitioner, you might be wondering, do you have a protocol? Because you just went over a lot of stuff and I don't want to go back to the webinar every time I want to remember it. Yes, we have a protocol. So everything I just told you is in a protocol. This is a picture of it in the middle. This is a one pager. So this is everything on one page, but then there are other pages to this handout that you can have digitally or you can print them out. And it goes into more detail, so it breaks down phase one and phase two and phase three, sort of similarly to how I did here today. So the link to that will be in the video description down below. And if you haven't heard of Kanzita before and you're wondering how long they've been around, do people actually use them? Are they well known? That sort of thing. Yeah, Kanzita has been on the forefront of Candida and gut health restoration for over a decade. Kanzita products are used all over the world. They are trusted by integrative and functional practitioners in Hong Kong, Australia, United Kingdom, in the United States, all over the world. And this brings us to the end of the first webinar in the practitioner development series provided by Kanzita. I want to thank you so much for watching and spending this time. There was a really a great deal of information. I hope you learned so much here. And if you are wanting to get any of the Kanzita products that we mentioned, the link to the store for those is in the description below. And if you watched this and you want to get 10% off of those products, you can use the code Dr. Blake. So that's Dr. Blake written here, but there's no period in it. So it's Dr. Blake. Use that code for 10% off in the store. If you have any questions at all uh, for Kanzita, you can call or email at the website there, kanzita.com slash contact. And that's the phone number where you can call for customer support. And if you want to reach out to me at all, that's my clinic logo there, Chiron Healing Arts. And then that's my email, Dr. Blake. There's dr.blake at chironhealingarts.com. And please subscribe to the Kanzita channel and see when we get more of these awesome practitioner development series up and send us your success stories. Let us know how this is going. What, what kinds of amazing results have you seen in your practice after you implemented what you learned here today? All right, everyone be well, and I will see you next time.